You've been walking for days. Your body aches. You're dripping with sweat from the heat of the sun bearing down overhead. And yet you're wrapped up in layers upon layers of clothing. Even your face is covered. And you're wearing thick black goggles so that not a single centimeter of your body is exposed. Your journey has been long, and you feel like you might die from exhaustion or from overheating due to these multiple layers of clothes. But dying is better than being exposed. You saw it happen when your entire team changed. The light cannot be trusted, not even for a fraction of a second. It's been like this for years. You've learned and survived through painful experience. Many of those you used to know cannot say the same. You've been alone for so long. You might have given up all hope if it wasn't for the distress signal coming from a nearby SCP Foundation containment facility, Site 46. Any kind of survivors would be better than nothing, no matter what kind of sorry shape they were in, as long as they were still human. You find your way to an opening in the side of a mountain and slide into the cave, hoping you weren't spotted. The whole world is crawling with those things now. You can't let yourself be seen. As you trudge down the cave towards the entrance, you see what looks like a huge black snail trail splattered on the ground, leading into the facility. You try to avoid it and press on. You don't even need a key card to enter. The door has been left ajar. The facility reeks of those things, but you can't see any of them. You just hope they've moved on and left some human survivors in their wake. The place looks abandoned. Every step you take echoes through the empty halls. When you find that the elevator's out, you take the stairs all the way down to level B5, Keter Containment. Lucky for you, it seems all the cells are empty now. The horrors that were kept inside of them have all long since flown the coop. You keep following that slimy black trail until you find an abandoned office. There are no people here anymore. Just a broken barricade, some empty medicine bottles, and a bucket that the people inside the office had apparently been using as a toilet. You breathe a sigh of disappointment at finding no one alive here, but you're at least relieved to be out of the sun. You can finally remove your jacket and head wrap. With your uncovered eyes, you notice that a nearby computer terminal is still powered up. You sit down at the desk and turn on the monitor. Because of the emergency procedures put into place in a K-class scenario like this, safeguards no longer apply. You can access all the information you need, up to and including finding out what actually happened. In the dull glow of a nearby emergency light, you see a dark shape slumping through the halls in shadow. You tense up, then exhale as it slithers off into an adjoining hall. You're safe for now. The terminal has finally loaded and authenticated your access. You're staring at the file for SD Lock's proposal for SCP-001 when day breaks. It's the only name you can give the apocalypse your world is currently experiencing. This is one of the only anomalies in the entire history of the SCP Foundation to be given the Apollyon Containment class, meaning containment is truly impossible. SCP-001 is the most dangerous enemy that the Foundation and planet Earth has ever faced. It's always been the principle of the SCP Foundation to battle in the dark so that the civilian world can thrive in the light, but now the light has become the enemy. Anyone exposed to any amount of sunlight for even the briefest period of time is subjected to the effects of SCP-001, and those effects are beyond horrifying. The SCP Foundation Administrator released an urgent memo telling Foundation personnel to make their way to Site-19 at all costs, because they need all the help they can get. Those exposed to SCP-001 in the process are no longer considered human. Their new designation is SCP-001-A. These new entities are to be avoided at all costs. But in case of emergencies, the administrator says it is permitted to cut off parts of your transformed comrades and eat them to avoid starvation. The memo empathically states that no attempt should be made to kill them, since you won't succeed. You'll just put yourself at risk. 
When the sun changed and became SCP-001, it instantly affected 6.8 billion innocent people. The second the visible light touched them, whether it was from the sun itself or even reflected off the moon, their bodies liquefied, melting like candle wax into puddles of living gelatinous slime. This effect isn't isolated to humans either. Any biological entity exposed to sunlight immediately underwent the same irreversible melting process into SCP-001-A, and the horror had only just begun. People transformed into SCP-001-A will remain shades of their former intelligence and personality. They may even try to will their new gooey mass into a shape resembling their original form. However, these individuals will lose their sense of self if they come into contact with other instances of SCP-001-A. When they come together, 001-A instances will bond on a molecular level, wading up into horrific giant blobs with only one purpose, integrating more matter into their bodies. That's why they have to be avoided at all costs. You continue to search the computer terminal for answers. Perhaps there was some kind of contingency plan put in place for this, some way to reverse the effects, or at least escape the nightmare Earth has become. Instead, you find a series of attachments linked to the SCP-001 file, detailing what seems to be the last days of the people who'd barricaded themselves in the facility. Most prominent among these were researcher Dr. Logan Igata, her wife Ari, a security officer named Commander Anad, and a few others. Dr. Igata had locked herself in the office where she recorded her final messages to the world. In the first audio log, Dr. Igata and her companions seemed afraid, but hopeful that there may be some way out of this situation. Dr. Igata reported that most of the workers at the facility were transformed during the initial event. Their melted bodies had fused outside the facility, and now they were trying to bust their way back in. The defenses had held so far, though, and they seemed confident they would hold long enough for them to figure out a way to escape this awful situation. You open the second attachment, an incident report, and realize things may not have been as hopeful as Dr. Igata let on. She reported hearing the huge mass of melted creatures hammering on the door outside again, begging for them to come out and experience the sun with them. They wanted desperately to add to their ever-growing biomass. In order to experiment with what exactly would happen, they sent out one of their few remaining D-classes wearing a full protective suit. He didn't last long. The huge creature grabbed him with tentacles made of reconstituted flesh. It began ripping off his protective suit as he screamed for mercy. It was a monster made of dozens of people and animals. He could never overpower it. The second the sun touched his skin, he melted away and was absorbed by the great mass holding him in place. Guns were ineffective against these SCP-001-A superentities. Fire would do no good. It seemed that extremely low temperatures were the only way to slow the immense blobs down. And even then, not permanently. There was one ray of light in the darkness. The site director had a secret tunnel underneath his office, connected to a tram that could hopefully take them directly to Site-19 without risk of SCP-001 exposure. It was a good plan, and by far the best option they had available to them. But the best plans often don't work in practice. You open the next attachment on the terminal. This time, it's a video feed. You can actually see Dr. Logan Igata, and she looks harrowed by what she's experienced. As it turns out, while the others, including her wife Ari, attempted to exit through the tunnel, something had happened. Dr. Igata heard Ari's voice over her radio, but there was something wrong with it. It was too low, too guttural, and filled with gurgles. SCP-001 had gotten her. She was changed. The monster from above had crawled in through the ceiling. It had taken them, all of them, and converted them into something less than human. Any hope of escape now seemed gone. Ari told Dr. Igata that it would be fine, that it was such a bright, beautiful day outside, and she was wasting it locked up inside that office. She tormented Dr. Igata with shared memories of their life and love, of that day in the sun where they bound their lives together. The monster with Ari's voice did everything it could to try to convince her to give up and join them, but she wasn't ready to go just yet. 
You look away from the screen when you hear a sound in the corner. You see a dark puddle of some unknown substance, and then some skeletal hands rising out of it. The hands are pulling themselves out of the puddle, followed by a skeletal face covered in matted hair. You have to stop yourself from screaming, until a flash from a nearby security light makes the figure disappear. It's a normal puddle once again. Your mind is playing tricks on you. You open the next attachment, another video, and see that Dr. Igata's condition has deteriorated. She looked pale, frantic, and thin. She was using a knife to draw her own blood onto a piece of blood-stained parchment covered in strange symbols. Igata ranted about her theory. What if 001 took the minds and bodies of its victims, but not their souls? Through performing some kind of arcane blood ritual, she hoped to at least rescue and keep the soul of Ari, even if her mind and body were lost. You open the next attachment. It seemed that Agata's ritual worked, but not in the way she hoped. The twisted soul of Ari, driven mad by SCP-001, had taken over the file. It begins corrupting the text of the SCP-001 file into crazy ranting about how futile it is to fight. It then cuts to an even more frightening video feed. Dr. Igata, in her sleep, tossing and turning in a makeshift bed in the corner of her office. The camera approaches her, in first person, and lingers over her sleeping body. An oily, skeletal hand reaches past the camera and runs its fingers through Dr. Igata's hair. It's that exact same hand you saw reaching out of that black puddle earlier. You must have seen Ari's lingering spirit. With a lump in your throat, you open the next attachment and watch the video. You see Dr. Igata, now truly broken. She'd been haunted by Ari's demonic spirit for a long time now, and it has clearly taken its toll. She is waving around a handgun while she speaks. She now believes there is only one way to escape, but not like this. She doesn't want the gun to draw attention to her body. She doesn't want to become part of that mass, even if she is dead. She opens a drawer on her desk she's recording at and places the gun inside. Dr. Igata then apologizes to her loved ones who are likely long since dead or assimilated and turns off the recording for the last time. In that moment, you realize there's a single drawer in the desk in front of you. When you reach forward and open it, you see the same handgun Dr. Igata was holding is laying inside. You pick it up and study it, weighing your options. Perhaps there truly is no other way out. Then you see an update on the file. One more attachment has been added while you were studying the gun. You feel your heart pounding in your chest as you reach forward and open the attachment. The text has been changed entirely. The file on SCP-001 is now a poem, an ode to the sun and to the love they shared. Then a video file spontaneously opens itself on the screen. It's a video of you, shot from behind. You see those oily, skeletal hands reaching for you in the dark, just like they did with Dr. Igata. In that moment, you panic and fire the gun behind you, hoping to scare off the spirit. Instead, the sound of the gunshots attracts something far worse. The immense blob of screaming, melted flesh charges towards the office. You try to barricade the door, but it is not enough. The flesh seeps and bursts through and grabs you in its meaty tentacles. You scream and try to escape, but it won't save you. Nothing will save you. The flesh carries you upstairs, out through the empty halls, out into the cave. You can see the light in the distance as the blob ferries you towards it. You won't be alone for much longer. In fact, you won't be alone ever again. It's tough to know how we might respond to a true disaster. What might any of us do when the world turns upside down and nothing makes sense anymore? What if the simple act of stepping outside into the sunlight became the deadliest thing in the world. We've delved into this horrifying notion before with SCP-001 When Day Breaks, or SD Locke's proposal, one of the most nightmarish XK-class end-of-the-world scenarios ever devised. Mr. Rogers once said that the best thing to do in times of trouble is look to the helpers. No matter how dire things become, there will always be those taking up the difficult work of putting their community back together. 
firefighters, emergency medical services, soup kitchens. There are so many different kinds of helpers out there. Unfortunately, most of them would be the first to go once the sun's rays turned on us all. The firefighter attempting to put out a blaze would melt into a puddle of goo. The EMT running out of an ambulance would melt the second his feet hit the pavement. When doom and destruction are everywhere, who is left to help? Perhaps someone who has always dreamed of saving humanity from a great plague, but is trapped inside with no sunlight in sight. When the whole world has grown sick, humanity forever changed into something terrible. We just might need a doctor. Today, we're looking at what happens when a dedicated physician meets his greatest challenge yet. We've discussed SCP-049 many times before. He's a humanoid entity standing roughly 1.9 meters in height, resembling a man dressed in the garb of a medieval plague doctor. He is clad in thick, dark robes and a ceramic mask that tapers into a long, sharp beak. Though it may look like a costume, these adornments are actually part of the entity's body. SCP-049 wants one thing, to cure humankind of a mysterious pestilence, the nature of which has never been entirely clear. Sadly, his work tends to do more harm than good. He can kill with a single touch, and his attempts to cure human subjects result in malformed zombies instead. He carries around a black doctor's bag capable of holding an impossible amount of medical implements, which he uses to perform his work. Though his actions tend to result in more harm than good, the plague doctor seems to genuinely care about his patients, their well-being, and curing them of the illness he believes to be ravaging their bodies. SCP-049 is singular in his obsession with eradicating the plague he so often speaks of, and he will not stop until he has done so. But what does a doctor do when there are no more patients left to treat? When humanity has been wiped out and the pestilence is gone for good. Let's peek in on the doctor in his containment cell and see what he's up to. It appears that he's working on something, or perhaps it's better to say, someone. But what is this new creation? It looks too small to be a human, too human-like to be an animal. It looks too much… like him? Has it finally happened? Has the plague doctor begun to reproduce himself? It seems the answer is yes, but not in the way you might think, since it appears what he has created is a plush version of everyone's favorite masked malady man. That's right, the plague doctor has created something special, and now for the first time you can have a plague doctor of your very own by going to scpswag.com and ordering one right now. And with this one, you don't have to worry about waking up to find that you've been converted into a walking zombie-like shell of your former self. No, this nearly 10-inch tall plush, which comes complete with his own removable doctor's bag, is a soft, squeezable version of the SCP-049 that we all know and love. Or fear. Put him on your shelf, carry him with you in your own bag, or set him on your desk so that you always have someone to discuss your own theories of what exactly the pestilence is. We just can't promise that he'll divulge any secrets, since this little plague doctor seems especially tight-lipped. We know you'll love him as much as we do, though, so go to scpswag.com and order one for yourself right now. Supplies are limited, so don't wait. But back to the taller and more mobile plague doctor. The doctor sat in his containment cell, as he did every other day of his captivity, doing his best to keep busy. The scientists of the SCP Foundation were small-minded. They did not comprehend the gravity of his work, the necessity of ridding the world of the pestilence. He forgave them for their ignorance, for they did not know what they were doing. Instead, he kept his mind on the goal, the duty he had as a physician and a man of the sciences. Just as many scientists had done in the past when their work was unappreciated, Copernicus was persecuted for his model of the universe and his knowledge that the Earth revolved around the Sun, Jonas Salk for his controversial invention of the polio vaccine that saved countless lives. SCP-049 would be remembered fondly by history for his contributions, even if his contemporaries did not understand his vision. And so, in spite of the suspicion and doubt that surrounded him at this foundation that should have been all for groundbreaking research, the doctor carried on with his work. He sat on the floor of the cell, his bag open next to him. From its endless interior, he withdrew syringes, bottles of viscous liquids, tissue samples suspended in jars, 
and a stainless steel table upon which he could place it all. Today, he would perform a new round of tests on samples he had been able to extract from previous patients before he was thrown into this unjust imprisonment. These doctors, men he had once viewed as colleagues, had not brought him a new test subject in quite some time. A guard had muttered something about it being too costly to keep wasting perfectly good cows on him. Simpletons, fools, Luddites beating their fists against their own chests in the face of true progress. Their small minds were of no concern to him. The doctor placed his tools on his work table and began to take out the samples. An ear, a piece of skin taken from the bottom of a foot, a section of a liver, and, most exciting of all, the frontal lobe of a human brain. Indeed, it would be a fruitful day of investigation into the mysteries of the great dying. He was just pulling a scalpel from his bag when his concentration was suddenly interrupted by the sound of a blaring siren. He set his tools down and looked up. That sound, it signified trouble at the facility, but surely it would be over soon once the issue had been dealt with. Outside his cell, he could hear the thundering footsteps of guards running past, shouting at one another too quickly for him to understand. One man stepped over to peer into 049's cell, making sure he was still contained, most likely. My good fellow! The doctor called out, reminding himself to speak in the king's English so the man could understand. Would you be so kind as to enlighten me? What is the trouble? If anyone has been injured, I would be happy to offer my assistance. The man did not respond, his attention grabbed by something further down the hall that the doctor could not see. Wait! He cried, but the guard had already disappeared. The siren continued to blare, assaulting his senses with its shrill tone. In the distance, he could hear screams. Surely, there was a dire situation at hand. Had that damnable reptile escaped again? He approached the door to his cell, listening for further information. There was no roaring, no sounds of walls crumbling. There was only that blasted alarm and the screams of unadulterated fear and agony. Very curious and quite troubling. SCP-049 tried to open the door, knowing that it was futile. He had never been able to escape before. Why would that change now? Still, a scientist must repeat his efforts in order to gather new data. So he thrust his shoulder against the door, attempting to break it down. It did not budge. Instead, an automatic containment measure was triggered, releasing lavender-scented gas into the room in an attempt to calm the doctor down. He did love the scent. It reminded him of gentler times long ago. He took a deep breath, imagining fields of purple flowers swaying in the summer breeze. That was the world he fought for, not the flawed human beings that opposed him, not this sterile facility packed with the ignorant. For now, he would return to the work. If they did not desire his help, there was nothing more to be done. Sometime later, perhaps hours, perhaps days, he could not be certain when there was no sunlight to gauge the time by. The alarm fell silent. The doctor stopped his ministrations and listened. As the alarm had stopped, so too had the screams. In fact, the whole facility seemed to have gone completely, eerily silent. Hello, he called out, but there was no response save for a clicking sound. Now that was a sound he had heard before. Normally it signified the arrival of armed guards who would strap him into a harness, knock him out, and take him somewhere else. It was the sound of the door to his containment cell unlocking, but there was no one there. Could it be? Grabbing his faithful bag, SCP-049 cautiously pushed against the door. It swung open, revealing a darkened, vacant hallway. Gone were the harsh fluorescent lights, the D-Class personnel mopping bloodstains off the floors, the doctors hurrying by with clipboards in hand. Everyone was gone, from what he could see, at least. He would have to investigate further in order to know for sure. A scientist never assumes until they have all of the available information, after all. So SCP-049 walked the halls of the seemingly abandoned Foundation site expecting to be interrupted at any moment by an adversary in a white coat who would usher him back to his prison. But the interruption never came. As he rounded the corner past one of the containment facilities, a familiar voice called out to him. Excuse me? Please! Could you help me? Open the door! 049 stopped and peered into the room. It was the Possessive Masks Room, SCP-035. 
The doctor opened the door, and there it was, the porcelain mask grinning at him from its glass case. Thick, black liquid oozed from its eyes and wide-open mouth. Oh, wonderful! It's you! The mask gleefully enthused. My good man, you gentleman and scholar, would you please release me from this awful case? 049 paused, considering the potential ramifications of this action. No doubt you've noticed that things have changed around here. The mask continued. The foundation is different now. The old rules have gone out the window. Hmm. So it would seem, the doctor replied. I will not wear you. Understood? I will only release you from your cage. And for that, I will be eternally grateful, the mask promised. The doctor approached the glass case in several quick strides, and with one gloved fist, broke through the glass. Thank you, old friend, the mask cried out. Now, take me with you. The doctor shook his head. I have more pressing matters to attend to at the moment. If it is true, if they have all gone, then this facility is in dire need of a new head researcher. At his words, the mask's visage changed, the cheerful smile warping into an exaggerated frown. And you think you're the man for the job? How embarrassing! How truly tragic! Bite your tongue! The doctor retorted. Ah, but I don't have one! Some physician you are! The mask taunted. Unwilling to deal with the porcelain fiend's naysaying any longer, the doctor turned and swept out of the room. Now was not the time for such verbal sparring. He had so much to do. This whole facility could be his new workshop, his laboratory, and he would need assistance to help him manage it. But who was qualified enough, loyal to the cause, armed with sharp wit and a body free of pestilence? As he made his way through the pitch black halls, he felt something nudge his leg. He glanced down, uncertain what he would find, and saw a teardrop-shaped orange creature nudging him affectionately, gazing up at him with one large, unblinking eye. Next to his other leg, a mustard-yellow creature the same shape and size was rolling toward him. Are you friend or foe? The doctor asked. The creatures continued to nudge against his legs, seeming to want something. Attention, perhaps? He bent down and patted each creature gently. They rolled around his feet in circles, making a delighted babbling sound. Ah, companion it is. Well then, come along. As he continued his path, the little creatures rolled after him, keeping close to his heels. Suddenly, they began to babble loudly, in a panicked tone swarming around the front of his feet, as if to stop him. Is there a danger here, my ocular friends? The doctor asked. From the cell up ahead, a voice cried out in French. Help! Please! I am so hungry! The doctor rushed to the door, opening it to reveal a behemoth of a man with a large rounded chin and jaw, and deep-set eyes that peered down at him. The man grinned at the doctor with impossibly large teeth. Thank you, sir. I was sure I would die in there. As he stepped out into the light, the doctor could see this giant was dressed in a military uniform. Are you a military man? The doctor asked. Yes, I was a soldier in the French army once. The giant replied, before I became the greatest detective the world has ever known. The doctor clapped his hands delightedly, his eyes glittering from within his mask. Intelligence and loyalty, not to mention strength. You, my good man, are everything I have been searching for. Would you do me the honor of working as my assistant? I have a great deal of research to do, and could make use of a man with your many talents. The giant tipped his hat politely to the doctor. It would be my honor, sir. You may call me Fernand. He reached out for a handshake, but the doctor shook his head. It would be best if I did not. But it is a pleasure to make your acquaintance. He glanced down at the iPods, still skittering about anxiously. See, there is nothing to fear here. Unless I don't find something to eat soon, Fernand quipped. And so the doctor continued on his way, with Fernand and his new pets in tow. This was an excellent advancement, but he would need a great deal more help if he was to effectively run the Foundation. He recruited two other anomalies with a mind for scientific research, a small bird with a deafening voice, and a doctor himself, and an eloquent sea slug with years of hunting and adventuring experience. It was a relief to find fellow intellectuals here. As the ever-increasing band of anomalies approached the basement, Ferdinand peeked up noticeably. 
Something smells wonderful. Just beyond this door. Ferdinand opened the door and led the group into a treasure trove of corpses. They had found the Foundation's morgue. Rows and rows of drawers filled with test subjects and food for Ferdinand. It was everything the doctor could have possibly wanted. My dear Ferdinand, take as many as you can carry and follow me to the laboratory, the doctor declared. Tally ho! cried the slug. Cock and how! Dr. Spanko added. The doctor set up shop in one of the many expansive on-site labs. Though the electricity was out, he could still get a great deal of use out of it. There was so much space in here, so many more resources than his tiny cell had. Within a matter of hours, he had set up rows of IVs pumping out his serums into test subjects, reanimating them into more lab assistants. The newly revived corpses shambled around the lab, bringing him bone saws and forceps, vials and needles of all sizes, as the doctor worked harder than he had in years. The others were less help than he had hoped, but with so many newly treated patients to share the workload, he hardly noticed. All of these poor souls, victims of the pestilence, no doubt, and he had all the time in the world now to cure them. Before long, the once vacant halls of the Foundation were filled with the slow, plodding footsteps of his patients, dragging their swollen limbs across the ground, blinking their milky white eyes at the chaos outside of the windows of the facility. As 049 was absorbed in his work, the rest of the escaped anomalies began to realize that their freedom had come at a cost. Where there had once been friendly yellow sunlight beaming down on a lush green world, there was now an angry red fire in the sky, and a landscape covered in strange gelatinous masses, roving and oozing and moaning as one. They had escaped from their cells, but they were still trapped. Their prison had just gotten larger. The doctor had not yet noticed this unfortunate truth, so focused was he on treating the patients they had recovered from the morgue, at least the ones that had not been given to Ferdinand to satisfy his mammoth appetite. However, a week later, the doctor was horrified to discover that there were no more corpses left, no more patients to cure. He stood in the empty morgue, looking from drawer to drawer for just one body they had missed, proof that his work was not over so soon. What's the matter, Doctor? A sardonic voice behind him said. He turned to find SCP-035 attached to the face of a mannequin. I see you procured the body, he noted. No thanks to you, the mask replied. Oh, how sad, a doctor with no one to treat. What will you do now that you have no purpose in life? I wonder. There will be more, the doctor insisted. There is an entire world out there that needs my help. The mask laughed in disbelief. <laughs> You mean you haven't noticed? There's no world left to help! It's all gone to hell. Take a look for yourself. The doctor rushed to an upstairs window and gazed down at the destruction outside. The painful red sunlight, the rubble where there were once buildings, the masses of soft, gooey matter that aimlessly squelched along the ground. No. He put a hand to his beak, shaking his head. It, it can't be. But it is, said the mask, standing behind him. Its face was locked in a grin, delighted to see him suffering so. Your life's mission, gone. Just like that. The doctor's knees went weak as he tried to take it all in. Perhaps the mask was right. He had no purpose anymore. But then Ferdinand's voice boomed from below. Doctor, we need your assistance downstairs. Quickly. The doctor followed his assistant's cries and saw what was so urgent. One of the blob creatures, an entity he knew must have once been a human being, had found its way inside the facility. Ferdinand stood back from it, afraid to touch its slimy surface, but SCP-049 did not see a monster there, oozing across the floor. He saw someone who was sick, desperately ill, and in need of help, in need of a doctor. Do not be afraid, my friend. He sat down his bag and reached inside, as his reanimated helper swarmed around the blob creature. You are not well, but I am going to help you. The great dying may have been out of his grasp, but if the scene outside the window was anything to go on, there was still a plague raging across the earth, and he was going to find the cure. Don't forget, go to scpswag.com to order a Plague Doctor plush of your very own. That's scpswag.com. It was such a normal morning, almost comically uneventful. For the first time in what felt like forever, the morning newscasts had very little to say. 
They covered Fashion Week, some protests in the Capitol, a new health craze sweeping the nation, a funny viral video of a dog eating a pancake, the inspirational story of a young boy from the Midwest beating cancer, a minor political scandal out of Tallahassee, Florida that nobody would remember in a week, a round of interviews with an expert who'd written a new book about the long-term effects social media might have on our children. None of them knew back then that long-term was a luxury they couldn't afford. People went to work, to school. Some took the day off. Plenty took walks or jogs, deciding to exercise outside for a change. After all, it was such a beautiful sunny day out. What a terrible shame it would be to waste the light indoors. People were sleepwalking, so placidly, blissfully unaware of what was rattling down the tracks towards them. It was an uncharacteristically slow day down at Site 19. There hadn't been any containment breaches in over a week. A couple of new anomalies had been brought into containment, one safe class and one Euclid, but neither were the kind that was likely to bring the SCP Foundation any trouble. Right now, the biggest threat facing their employees seemed to be boredom, and they definitely take that over any other members of their rogues gallery. Dr. Bright poured himself a mug of nice, hot coffee and decided to watch some TV in the break room just to pass the time. The President of the United States was giving a press conference on the White House lawn, surrounded by microphones. It was really nothing special, just the same inane babble about how he was going to fix the deficit, and with inflation on the rise, we'd all need to work on being more fiscally responsible. The Immortal Foundation researcher sipped his coffee. These normal, boring problems felt like the perfect escape from the insanity he needed to deal with every day at the Foundation. The president was saying something about the importance of families and about farmers being the nation's real backbone when something happened. There was an odd shift in the quality of the light. Dr. Bright barely registered it. Maybe it was something to do with the cameras. However, things started to get stranger. The president's speech began to slur, as though he'd just been pumped with enough morphine to take down an elephant. But it wasn't just that. He was sweating buckets, too. Wet patches expanded all over his suit, and perspiration was dripping off his skin. Dr. Bright was in suspense. Was he about to watch the president have a stroke live on air? Would he be called in to replace him yet again? But no. The situation unfolding was far, far worse. The President of the United States slumped forward over his podium while the reporting corps screamed. His face sloughed off his skull like melting wax, the President's words slurring off into infinity. It was the worst a U.S. President had looked on film since SCP-1981. Dr. Bright dropped his coffee cup. It tumbled and shattered onto the ground below. The camera fell as the operator screamed. It pointed down into the crowd where the reporters were shrieking in pain and terror, steam coming off their bodies with the sudden intense climb and heat. They were all melting. All of them were melting before his very eyes, broadcast out to how many people. It would be the mother of all containment nightmares. Little did Dr. Bright know, that wasn't even the half of the true horrors unfolding. Alarms went off across every containment site in the world. Any SCP Foundation employees unlucky enough to be standing outside at the time were lost in the rapidly unfolding horrors. They screamed as the sun cleaved their atoms apart, reducing them into semi-liquid states without the mercy of death. People lucky to be just out of the sun could only watch as those less fortunate disintegrated across the ground in unholy shrieking puddles. Never had such a normal day been thrown into such terrifying chaos in so little time. Billions of voices cried out at once as the sun changed in the sky above them. Since the dawn of humanity, it had given us everything. Light to bask in, warmth to keep us safe, and the life of the plants and animals that kept us fed. It had been worshipped as a god by countless cultures over thousands of years, one great mother to all of humanity. And now, that mother was drowning us in the bathtub. And perhaps the most frightening part of all, it was for seemingly no reason. No reason at all. The SCP Foundation was forced to now break their silence forever. The masquerade, the veil, it melted along with so much of humanity. They took over every communications channel in the world and did what they could to inform people on how to get out of harm's way. Stay inside. 
Wrap yourself in sun shielding clothing and only move at night. Air travel is preferable, if possible. If you can, make your way to one of the SCP Foundation's secure sites, their only chance of preserving humanity and figuring out how to reverse this new nightmare. Now more than ever, the SCP Foundation would be humanity's only hope. Until, of course, there was another terrifying twist in the tale. While those who were melted into piles of living flesh sludge were sadly assumed to be lost, even the Foundation didn't expect the transformed humans to become a threat in and of themselves. Just as their bodies were melted, so were their minds. They became slaves, cultists of the growing tyrant hanging up above. Some would coagulate into huge fleshy masses, horrifying threats that would seek out victims, overpower them, and drag them out into the light to be absorbed and transformed. Even those hiding inside Foundation containment centers weren't safe. These behemoths of melted flesh would find their way in, using their many twisted voices to slowly break the minds of their victims, then gather them up with great flesh tendrils and yank them out into their doom. Little by little, the numbers of humanity dwindled. It looked like we had a bright future ahead of us. And in this particular context, that's far from a good thing. Survivors, for whatever time they had left, would forever remember this walking nightmare. The Foundation dubbed it SCP-001 to reflect its ultimacy, but to everyone else it had a different name. When day breaks. In a world where anything but darkness will kill you, is there anywhere left on Earth that's truly safe from the horrors of SCP-001? Five months into the never-ending horror of the solar singularity, Alice spooned herself a bowl full of warm Swedish meatballs. Delicious. She was part of an investigative detail from a nearby community, deep within the bowels of the only truly safe place for human beings on planet Earth, SCP-3008, also known as the Infinite Ikea. No sun had ever shone in there, only the lights, which fizz and flicker far above. Everyone inside thinks of it as a prison. Little do they know, what's left of humanity out there would kill to be inside this sanctuary. Alice had a team of ten with her. Their mission was simple. Continue the mapping effort of the area surrounding their community and collect rations for the rest of the camp. It was dangerous work, especially as night drew close. But there were certain rewards. When they reached a feeding station, they were able to enjoy fresher food than anyone else. All they needed to do was wager their lives for it. To Alice, it seemed like a fair trade. Her Lieutenant Darcy kept watch to the north. He and several others wielded makeshift spears made from curtain rods and clubs fashioned from bedposts. Knives scavenged from the kitchen section hung from their belts in makeshift holsters. During the day, they were little more than a precaution. At night, it could mean the difference between life and death. Speaking of, Darcy kept a close watch on a member of staff. It was a lanky, faceless monster in that garish uniform, with a bulbous, oversized head and long arms, hanging slack like pulled taffy, dragging its knuckles along the ground as it stumbled along. Darcy thought it darkly funny how stupid they could look in the daytime, like crash test dummies rejected from the assembly line. Bear stood close by. He never gave any of them his real name, so they took to calling him Bear, because he was big, hairy, and would probably tear you to shreds if you got on his bad side. He wielded the largest club of all, a customized creation with sharp objects sticking out of it on all sides. It cleaved the heads of many staff members off their bodies. Bear seemed to relish the task of putting those monsters down. For him, it was easy and fun. That's why he was an essential asset on these missions. A berserker. Most of the grunts shoveled as much food as they could carry in IKEA-branded Tupperware and coolers. The more they gathered, the longer it would take for them to be forced out beyond the safe walls of the haven they built inside this Swedish flatpack hell. They all made do with what they had in here. It was all they could really do. Two members of the team were unaccounted for, Cyril and Joseph, would pass for reconnaissance experts down here. They seemed to have an innate sense of direction, as though they were somehow in tune with the IKEA itself. They would be sent out on scouting missions, searching for resources, food, other survivors, and most prized of all, potential escape routes. It was a dream, a fantasy, that someday one of them would find the exit 
and lead the rest of them to salvation through it. Alice had been trapped in the infinite Ikea for six years, going on seven now. She had long since given up on dreams of escape. All they could do was accept their situation, get used to it, and just try to survive under these circumstances. But those circumstances were about to change. Everyone looked up when they heard panicked breathing. It was Cyril, just Cyril. The party clutched their weapons just that little bit tighter, unsure of what had happened. Their rules were clear. Scouting duos must never ever separate under any circumstances. Getting lost in the store and being isolated when the lights went out would be a death sentence. So if Cyril was returning alone, frightened, tears streaking down his face, then something truly awful had happened. He told Alice and the rest of the group that something had attacked him and Joseph. When Alice told him that was impossible, that the staff wouldn't show active aggression until lights out until someone attacked them first, Cyril shook his head and let out a heaving sob. He told them that the creature that attacked them wasn't a member of staff, it was something else entirely. Something he'd never seen inside the Ikea before. A true monster. Whatever this creature was, it moved around a corner incredibly fast. It spoke in a way that was almost human, but something was off about it. Something that sent a chill down Cyril's spine just thinking about it. He recalled that the creature was large and blob-like, flesh-colored, with long grasping tendrils that whipped and flailed unnaturally. These tendrils had wrapped around and grasped Joseph. He hadn't been quick enough. The two of them were too shocked by the sight of it to react in time. And then it was already too late. It grabbed Joseph and yanked him off into an adjoining aisle. Cyril still remembered his haunting screams getting quieter and quieter as he moved further out of sight. On some level, everyone hoped that Cyril was lying. It was preferable to believe that he himself had snapped and murdered Joseph for some unknown reason, as opposed to some new, stronger, and even more dangerous creature that was now inside the Ikea. Was this some kind of upgrade? As they acclimated to the environment, adapted, gotten better at surviving here, had the Ikea in turn created deadlier countermeasures to destroy them all? just when you thought you had a handle on things. But if Cyril was telling the truth, and there was some kind of creature lurking in the store, or potentially more than just one, then they could be in danger just standing here. They gathered up the group, along with any supplies worth taking, and set off back to their community. They would need to deliver the bad news so they could potentially prepare for the worst. It was just one of the many communities housed within SCP-3008. Many have theorized over the years that the infinite IKEA acts as a kind of nexus point for IKEAs all across the multiverse, accounting for the truly insane number of people who have gone missing without a trace into the building over the years. There were children who had been born in the IKEA, raised in the IKEA, known nothing but the IKEA. Nobody knew an exact number for sure, but it was more than possible that the population of a small country resided within its walls. Sometimes communities would fracture and fall apart, occasionally due to a lack of resources or infighting, other times due to an overwhelming attack from the staff that physically destroyed the settlement, often leaving many of its members dead in the process. Those who weren't picked off while wandering the store in the following days would likely integrate into other nearby communities as refugees. Life was cruel in the infinite Ikea. By the time Alice and her party returned to their community, it was almost lights out. They spoke to the community leaders and informed them of Joseph's tragic disappearance, as well as this awful new creature that Cyril claimed had taken him. They thought it best not to inform the rest of the community tonight. It might hurt their focus and cause unnecessary panic. Alice agreed to join the watch that night. She could feel something wrong in the air. Even more so than usual, there was something terrible in this anomalous Ikea. Alice stood atop the furniture wall with several other rangers. As the lights flickered off, the distinctive calls sounded across the store from the activated staff members. The store is now closed. Please exit the building. It was almost soothing in its familiarity compared to the frightening thoughts that Cyril had left swimming through her mind. The staff she could handle, it was at least the devil she knew. And there were worse beasts than the devil out there. She knew it in her bones. They killed a few staff members that happened to wander towards the community and began beating their deformed fists against the walls. 
all standard procedure. But as Alice's eyes adjusted to the darkness, she saw a huge shape in the distance. It looked like a mountain that breathed, a huge wobbling mass of flesh moving impossibly fast for a creature of its size. It was so much vaster than the creature that Cyril had described earlier. Was this a different one, or had it simply gotten bigger? Either way, it was coming straight towards them. The community came alive in sudden panic. Every able-bodied adult grabbed their weapons and prepared for the fight of their lives behind the wall. Whatever this monster was, they needed to kill it as quickly as possible before it destroyed everything they built. Sadly for everyone inside the community, this was one fight that none of them were prepared for. The beast crashed into the furniture wall, crushing it inwards. People struck at the monster's immense and terrible flesh with their weapons, making awful wet slaps, but seeming to cause no lasting impact. It just kept rolling in, grasping everyone it could with its long, sinewy tendrils. But the horrors were only just beginning. With the wall destroyed, the staff began to pour in, chanting in monstrous unison, The store is now closed. Please exit the building. It was a massacre, perhaps one of the worst that the inside of the infinite Ikea had ever seen. While the community battled the giant flesh beast, the forces of the staff swarmed and overwhelmed them. Darcy was tangled in the nightmarish tentacles of the beast. Bear was surrounded by a truly insurmountable number of staff members, each one bawling their terrible fists and beating him to death. Somewhere Cyril screamed, though his scream was soon cut short. Alice watched in horror as everything she'd known was destroyed. Alice realized her friends were dead and her community was in ruins. She grabbed her spear and did the only thing she could. She ran. She ran from the lost cause that had once been her life, tears running down her cheeks. What had even happened? What the hell had that great monster been? The Ikea's trump card? She ran aimlessly for as long as she could, then walked and eventually limped. She went on for hours, getting lost deeper and deeper into unknown territory. She'd stop when she was dead. Why not? She had little left to live for. But like the Holy Grail, when she eventually truly gave up and stopped looking for salvation, it found its way to her. As she turned a corner down a mysterious aisle, she saw something that she hadn't seen in years. Glass double doors. She stifled a sob. Could it be the way out of here after all this time? And it was. The world. Escape. She'd lost everything, but regained this. Outside, dawn was breaking. After years, the great red sun. It was the most beautiful thing she'd ever seen in her life. She took a deep breath, smiled, and stepped into the light. It has been one month since the end of the world. Thirty long days since Stella had watched her husband dissolve in front of her. One minute mowing the lawn like it was any other lazy afternoon, and the next collapsing into a useless pile of flesh and jelly. The end didn't come like she always thought it would, with hellfire raining down and pale riders galloping across the land on horseback. It began in the kitchen, with her humming a song to herself, mixing up a pitcher of lemonade before she rejoined her family in the sunshine. Then they were gone, lost forever when the sun turned wrong. She didn't even have time to grieve them properly before the threat turned on her as the creatures that had once been her husband, her son, and her daughter swarmed to the door, slamming their new bodies against the wood with wet slaps, calling out to her in warped voices, begging her to step back outside. She covered her ears and wept for hours, until she had no tears left to cry. It didn't take long for Stella to figure out that whatever had happened to her family, it was happening all over the world. The small town she had known and loved had transformed into a hellscape, a maze of monsters and deadly light. She retreated underground to old mine shafts and tunnels, left abandoned decades ago when the local coal trade had dried up. There she quickly discovered that she wasn't the only one with that idea. There were others, survivors, who had managed to make their way down into the dark, away from the horrors above. There weren't many and she could never get to attach to the one she did meet, in case they too were lost to the sun. But as the days wore on in the tunnels, 
she found herself forming a small group of stragglers. Not quite a family, but something that could be one day, and definitely much better than going it alone. There was Stella, of course, using her background as an elementary school teacher to keep everyone on track and working together. Then there was Brian, a former volunteer firefighter whose training and skills with an axe came in handy more than once. There was Trina, a teenage girl who had been babysitting when everything went to hell, who had a knack for evading the flesh monsters and making supply runs. And then there was Doris, former military nurse and current de facto team medic, sharp and capable, in spite of being in her late 70s. They were brave people, brilliant, and refused to give up. Others came and went, spare survivors they picked up as they navigated their way, raiding the ruins of grocery stores and hospitals, but they always wound up leaving again. Or, worse, something would go wrong, and the sunlight would claim another victim. But the four of them stayed together, stronger with their combined skills, willpower, and ability to sleep in shifts and keep an eye out for trouble. After some time in the tunnels, the group had come across a massive abandoned facility. None of them could determine where it came from or what organization might have run it, but it appeared to have been some kind of research lab. It was isolated, cut off from outside influences better than any of their previous hideouts had been. Whoever had once worked here had cleared out, or been taken out in a hurry. But in their place, they had left behind rations, medical equipment, emergency generators, and clean drinking water. There were enough supplies to keep the group going for months, if they rationed carefully. And so they settled in. The abandoned research facility, whatever it once was, became their makeshift home. This unexpected sanctuary was cut off from the rest of the world. Clinical, cold, lonely, but a safe place for them to rest their heads. Now it had been a month since this all began. Stella shook her head at this realization, the passage of time feeling almost meaningless at this point. What did a month even mean anymore? What was a day when she couldn't even see the sun rise and set? As she sat there warming herself by the side of a foraged space heater, she thought about missing the stars, the moon, the promise of the cosmos. A time when the vast open sky was an invitation to dream, instead of something to hide from. That time was gone now. There was nothing to do but mourn it and carry on, if not for her, than for the others. They had all found ways to keep busy in this new place. Trina took to exploring the empty halls, the laboratories filled with strange equipment, the small rooms that looked like prison cells or police interrogation rooms. She had cooked up some theory about it being a government facility, like something out of an old episode of The X-Files. Brian had found an on-site library, filled with history books and scientific texts. There was enough to read in there, he said, that by the time he was finished, he would have the equivalent of several doctorate degrees. Doris had taken initial stock of all the medical supplies available at the site. Gauze, disinfectant, vials upon vials of medications she had never heard of, and had categorized them all neatly. Now she spent her hours mostly sitting with Stella, telling her stories about whatever she felt like. Her time overseas, her late husband, their children, decades-old neighborhood gossip. It felt good to talk, no matter what it was about. It felt human. They all had their ways of keeping their grip on their own humanity. It had almost gotten boring, holed up in the facility without the constant threat of danger pressing in from all sides. Boring, but peaceful. Stella could feel herself starting to nod off, her eyelids sagging, her dinner of canned beans sitting heavy in her stomach. Next to her, Doris had already begun to softly snore. Soon sleep would come for her, too, and bring with it dreams, memory of the life that was gone forever, the world as she had once known it. The dreams were tough, but waking up from them was even tougher. Still, she had to rest. She could only fight it for so long. She could almost hear her husband's voice when, Hey, Stella, you might want to see this. Brian was there suddenly, his words breaking through the haze in her mind. His tone was severe, and she knew that sleep would have to wait. She followed him down the hall for a while, before he stopped and turned her attention to a section of a damaged wall. It was rusted and corroded, black and gray, with massive cracks in the solid material. It looked like it had been slowly disintegrated over time by an incredibly strong acid. It was off-putting to look at giving off the distinct sense that something bad had happened. 
but a lot of bad things had happened in the past month. I don't really understand what I'm looking at, Stella said, and Brian grabbed her by the shoulders, commanding her attention. This wasn't here yesterday. Hell, it wasn't here a few hours ago, he gestured to the damage. It just happened, and whatever is responsible is probably still here. A chill ran down Stella's spine. It seemed impossible for this kind of structural damage to happen over the course of a few hours. She could see twisted steel rebar, drips of melted metal that had trickled onto the floor. As she leaned in for a closer look, she gagged. There was an overpowering stench of rot and decay. It didn't take long for her to spot the source, a thick black mucus covering the hole in the wall, slick and slimy, and giving off the putrid smell. It wasn't like the material that had made up the flesh creatures outside, it was something else entirely. Something she had never seen before. She reached out a hand to touch it, but quickly caught herself. Whatever this stuff was, it was bad news. If it could do that to a solid wall, she didn't even want to think about what it could do to flesh and bone. What do we do? She asked. Inspect the area, make sure it's safe, see if it's some kind of toxic waste leak, or... He didn't finish the thought. He didn't have to. They needed to find out if this damage came from something living. Something that could be hiding in the building with them, and waiting for the chance to strike. When they returned to the main room, Doris was awake and Trina was there waiting for them. They agreed to split into pairs and search the facility, looking for any additional damage, strange black fluid, or signs of foul play of any kind. Trina and Brian went one way, while Doris and Stella went the other, each person armed with a flashlight and a weapon of some kind. An axe, a bat, a knife. Stella had found a loaded pistol when they first arrived, one that she hoped she would never have to use. Now she carried it with her, just in case. Stella and Doris walked together for an hour, keeping an eye out for anything suspicious. They didn't find anything notable, really. There were some bits of rust they hadn't seen before, an occasional black puddle pooling on the floor, but nothing like the scene Brian had found. As they walked in silence, Stella found herself beginning to relax. Maybe the worst was over. Maybe a pipe had broken somewhere, and broken down a bit of the wall, but nothing else would really come of it. Then, from the other side of the building, there came a high-pitched scream. She knew that voice immediately. Trina, screaming bloody murder, and Brian bellowing something. She grabbed Doris by the arm, and the two ran in the direction of the sound. As they got closer, they could hear other sounds in addition to Trina and Brian's yells. Loud cracking like something solid coming apart, bits of rubble falling to the ground, and the wet dripping sound of something thick hitting the floor. As the two rounded the corner to see what was happening to help their friends, Stella froze in shock. She had seen some harrowing things since that fateful sunny day. She almost thought she had become desensitized to horror, that there was nothing left in the world that could face her, but this moment proved her wrong. There was so much to take in and so little time. Brian was swinging his axe wildly at the floor, chopping at it helplessly in an attempt to break it apart. It quickly became obvious why. Trina was sinking into the floor, not through a hole into the basement below, but into the floor itself. It rippled and melted around her, changing from a solid surface to a thick pool of black sludge. She flailed and struggled, grasping at the ground around her, at Brian's arm, anything to yank herself free. But she wouldn't budge. She continued to sink. No, she wasn't just sinking. She was being pulled. Stella felt her legs begin to work again, and she rushed to Trina's side, grabbing hold of her arms with all the strength she had. All the while, Trina screamed in a mix of desperation, terror, and pain. Brian continued his assault on the ground, as if he could cut her free from the floor, and Doris moved to help Stella. She grabbed a hold of Trina's waist, but stopped suddenly. There, at the place where her body vanished into the floor, Trina was beginning to fall apart. Whatever had turned the floor into a portal, whatever had rotted away at the walls, it was taking its toll on her body, too. The flesh falling away from the bone, the muscles liquefying and everything becoming corrupted by that same black mucus. If they pulled any harder, Trina would be ripped in two, her chest, arms, and head on the surface, while her legs, stomach, and most of her vital organs were lost. There was no way to save her. Stella saw it when Doris did, and the two shared a long, sad look. Trina was here with them, still struggling for her life, 
but she was already gone. As if it felt their hopelessness, the force pulling on Trina from below then gave a horrifying yank they were praying to not have to witness, and she was swallowed up by the ground. All that remained was a sticky black smear, a large crack in the floor, and three survivors where there had just been four. None of the remaining three slept a wink that night. Brian paced back and forth, holding his axe. Doris went over their supplies again, looking for anything that could be used to treat the effects of the corrosive black fluid, and Stella ran over their potential options again and again. They could stay and hope that the thing that took Trina never came back, or they could leave and face the possibility of succumbing to the sun or the influence of the creatures that once were people. She recalled dimly an old adage, the devil you know beats the devil you don't. Maybe that was true. Maybe it would be better to take their chances with the outside rather than stay and be hunted. But she thought of her husband and children again, watching them melt onto the grass, and she shuddered. There were no good options here, but she couldn't risk going out like that. They would stay. Whatever had taken Trina, there were three of them, and only one of it. Besides, maybe it had already gotten what it wanted, and now it would move on. She didn't know it when she fell asleep, only that when she eventually woke up, she was alone. Brian and Doris were nowhere to be found. She called out their names as her heart leaped into her throat. For a moment, she feared the very worst. But then, Brian answered her. He had been patrolling, looking for signs of trouble, but he was fine. She asked if Doris was with him, and he went pale. He told Stella that Doris had gone to an on-site bathroom to get cleaned up hours ago before he left. She should have been back by then. Without another thought, they took off towards the bathroom and saw their worst fear realized. The door to the room was gone, rotted away, and Doris was gone with it. She had been taken before she even had the chance to scream. They stood there, taking in the reality of what had happened with silent shock. Then, a sound from behind caused them to turn around. It was a raspy, hollowed-out sound, like air forced from a dying man's lungs. A dry, empty, evil chuckle from an inhuman throat. There they saw the creature that had stolen their friends. From a distance, Stella could have confused it for a man, a very old, very sick man, but still human. As it shuffled closer, however, that illusion was shattered. Its eyes were black voids, its skin gray and putrefied, its mouth a gaping, toothless maw of shriveled black gums, and it was laughing at them like it was enjoying itself. There was the smell again, that overpowering reek of all things foul. Stella drew her pistol and fired several shots. She didn't have the best aim, especially not when her hands were shaking with fear, but one of the bullets found its target and hit the creature in the cheek. It hissed, not in pain, but a perverse amusement, as the lead tore a hole through its flesh like wet paper. Globs of black blood spattered everywhere, spreading the rot wherever they landed. To her side, she heard Brian cry out in pain. When she turned, he was clutching his right eye. Some of the liquid had hit him there, and it was already taking effect. Stella's stomach turned as she saw something white slide down the side of Brian's face, his eye melting out of its socket. The skin around it followed suit, softening like putty and dribbling away from the bloody muscle underneath. Brian collapsed to the floor as the creature continued to advance on them, laughing louder and louder. It knew that bullets couldn't kill it, knew that there was nowhere to run. Stella grabbed a hold of Brian's arms, prepared to carry her fallen friend to safety, but he stopped her. I'm done for, he said quietly. If you try to carry me, you are too. She shook her head, unwilling to leave him behind, and he touched her cheek, forcing a smile on his decaying face. I, I didn't think I'd make it this far. I, I wouldn't have without you, so run, save yourself." She could hear the resignation in his voice and knew that he would not let her save him. I'll, I'll hold him off as long as I can, Brian promised, and with tears in her eyes, Stella turned and ran as fast as she could. As her feet pounded the ground, blood rushing in her ears, she could hear Brian screaming and cursing at the creature until his voice quickly faded into a wet gurgle, and then silence. Stella sat in the center of the room that she and the others had once shared, clutching her scavenged pistol in her hands. Every creak, every errant sound made her jump. It could be anywhere, come from anywhere. She had escaped from so much already, 
survived more than anyone was ever meant to, had lost her love, her friends, her home, she wouldn't lose herself too. She held her breath as she heard it, clear in the darkness, drip, drip, drip. Her grip on the weapon tightened, and she readied herself. If she had to go down, she might as well go down swinging. The old man, whether he was a man, a monster, or death itself, wouldn't be taking her anywhere, not without a fight. We'd been so cautious, keeping quiet, only moving at night, but sometimes, despite all your best efforts, you just get unlucky. We made our way through what we thought was an abandoned street, littered with broken down cars when those things had slithered out and ambushed us. Kaspar, who was always the most trigger-happy of us, panicked and opened fire with his scavenged submachine gun on the largest of the creatures. Big mistake. It didn't slow the monster down, and only seemed to attract more. It'd be Blob City before sunrise now, but poor Kaspar wouldn't make it that long. Fleshy tendrils wrapped around his limbs and pulled him into the terrible mass of one of the creatures. It started reshaping around him enveloping him as he screamed until the tide of flesh coursing down his throat silenced him. The whole time, the monster just kept gibbering madness in a warped voice. Become one, yes. Let our cells bond and our minds coagulate in the glorious shimmering light. We will all be one in daylight, pretty flower. Yes, yes, yes. And then there were four. Me, Ellen, Darcy, and Jones. There had been more of us once, but in this war of attrition, we always seemed to be the ones who had to lose. And if we didn't get away from these monsters quickly, then there wouldn't be any of us left soon enough. We ran, ducking and weaving around the cars as the blobs got closer. There were so many of them all howling and ranting, zealots for the only cause their melted excuses for minds could understand anymore. Occasionally, we fired back, hoping to slow them down a little, but it never worked. The guns, if anything, were a psychological support mechanism, and something to scare off other survivors who were even more desperate than us. When it came to the blobs, especially the big ones, the only things you could do were run and hope, and hope's in short supply these days. No matter how fast we ran, the blobs kept catching up, and they didn't seem to get tired. Knowing we couldn't outrun them, we ran up to one of the abandoned cars and crouched behind them, breathing raggedly. This whole stupid mission, in hopes of eventually reaching safety. A good night's sleep behind solid walls and some people who actually know what the hell is going on. I drew my sidearm out of my pocket. Even if I didn't make it out of here, I wouldn't turn into one of those monsters. Pulling back the hammer, I muttered a quiet prayer. But there's a god out there, he had a hell of a lot to answer for right now. I looked to Ellen, Darcy, and Jones and they all had the same idea. It was a pleasure to know them all, after everything that had happened. We heard the blobs getting closer, their lunatic whispers growing in volume and intensity, as they always did before they claimed one of us. I breathed in a sigh, ready to accept my fate, knowing what I needed to do. It all seemed to be over, until he appeared. I looked up and spotted a strange man approaching. He was dressed in an old-fashioned hessian toga, his hair and beard frosty white. I couldn't identify his age or race, but those factors seemed secondary to the fact his eyes were glowing brilliant white, as if exuding pure energy. He raised a hand, the same glowing aura of pure white energy emanating off of it. I'd seen so many things that terrified me in the past six months, but this, this was the first time I'd experienced something I could call awe. He walked towards us with a stillness and confidence and said, you look like you could use a hand. Where were you when day broke? Whoever's left, they remember. I was in a supermarket with my wife and two kids. Just another normal day. I was worrying about bills, taxes, and whatever we were going to have for dinner that night. If the devil exists, I'd sell my soul to that nasty red creep to get those worries back. Lucky for us, we were in the back half of the store, lit entirely by artificial light. The people checking out their groceries down front, right in the front of the building's huge glass facade, they were the first to go down. All these terrible, drowned screams. First, the exact kind of shrieks you'd expect from somebody starting to melt, then the gurgling, like a backed up drain as their mouth and throat melted around the sound, choking it. Those were the first few minutes of hell on earth. I've never been the smartest man. I was a roofer, back when things made sense. Never went to college, never been much for reading. But I had intuition, 
and I credit that with surviving this long. My dad was in the service, two tours in Nam. He always told me when I was a kid, the guys who didn't make it back, they panicked. Because that's what the enemy wants you to do. They hope when everything hits the fan, you'll break formation, forget the plan, and I'll start scurrying in different directions like rats, just hoping you'll be the one who finds a crack and gets out. That's when they get you. When you panic, you're giving up the birthright of reason and letting the animal take over. And animals, son, are easier to kill. When the sun went bad that day, plenty of people in that store started running. They didn't know what they were running from or where they were running to. They just wanted to put some distance between themselves and the screaming. Every man for himself. I'd love to tell you all those people are dead now, but in actuality, they were in for a far worse fate. They ran out of the safety and cover of the store, putting themselves at the mercy of the light. Even as they melted, they kept running. They were blobs, slithering away, not even knowing that the thing they were running from had already gotten them. It all happened so fast, but I can remember every single detail. You can judge me if you like, I don't care anymore. If I could have spoken reason to those terrified people that day, hand on my heart, I would have. But one of man's greatest design flaws is that God made fear the master of reason. Nothing I could have said that day would have changed anything. The only ones I could hope to save were my family, so that's exactly what I did. We grabbed what we could, stayed away from windows, and made our way to the nearest supply closet. We were in there for hours, and we didn't come out until things were actually quiet, which coincidentally happened to be night. When we stepped outside the store, we saw the carnage that must have unfolded over the past few hours. Windows smashed, cars driven into storefronts and abandoned, slithering blobs of former people on the ground. In the space of a few hours, the world had truly and irrevocably changed. No matter what happened, even if we survived, we knew there would never be a normal as we'd know it before ever again. The same message was playing on every TV, radio, and computer. A logo I didn't quite recognize, along with an overlay that read, An important message from the SCP Foundation. It explained in an eternally looping robotic voice that they were superseding the control of all world governments to protect humanity from this new and terrifying threat. In short, the sun had turned against us. In some scenarios, survival is a curse. In those early days and weeks, you wouldn't believe the number of times I started to envy the dead. People who'd been wiped off the mortal coil by disease and car crashes and random acts of violence in the days before day broke. They had no idea how good they had it. Little by little, in this terrible new world, death became a kind of luxury. Because melting under the fiery gaze of the sun, that wasn't death, not even close. They seemed harmless at first, tragic, pitiful really. The voices on the TV even told us that to avoid starvation, we could eat small parts of the melted. But over time, the situation evolved. I don't know when it started or why, but the blobs that had once been people started coagulating. They joined up, started turning into bigger creatures, all with one mind, always screaming and talking madness in a collage of stolen voices. These monsters existed for one purpose, and one purpose only, finding the people who were still normal and dragging them out into the light to join them. They roamed the world during the night, hunting, seeking, and given night was the only time we could ever safely move, this created problems for all of us. We lost so many to those terrible monsters, including my wife and both my kids. See what I mean about survival sometimes being a curse? Especially when you've got people to miss. I wish they were dead, all three of them, but I still hear them. Their voices added to the chorus of a house-sized flesh monster. But I lived on, if you can call this living. I met with others like Kaspar, Ellen, Darcy, and Jones. All of them had lost people. You hadn't lived this long if you hadn't lost people. We did all we could to keep surviving against the odds. We spent our days in basements and abandoned stores, and our nights dodging the flesh creatures and foraging for food. We eked out each day, taking every breath as it came. We didn't help for anything. Until one day we heard that the people at the SCP Foundation might know how to reverse all this. They needed all the people and help they could get at one of their bases, around 20 miles from us. It'd only be a couple nights walk to get there, we figured, so why not help out the cause? Safety in numbers, after all. And, truth be told, we miss people. After days of hiding and nights of traveling, we were ambushed, but you already know about that part. We lost Kaspar to one of those monsters and got cornered behind an abandoned car. However, as the blobs got closer and closer, that mysterious stranger with the glowing eyes appeared. He didn't walk like the rest of us. He was bold, 
confident, his back straight as a dancer's, like he feared nothing, like nothing here could hurt him. Suddenly I felt a rumbling behind me. The car was rattling. I feared for a second that the blobs were crawling over it to get us, but when I turned I saw the opposite was happening. The car was rising off of the ground, free floating. Myself and the other survivors stared in astonishment as the stranger simply flicked his wrist. The floating car was thrown with tremendous force at the largest of the advancing blobs. It hit the piece so hard that the top of it simply splattered off, freezing what was left in place. Even the other blobs paused, seemingly astonished. We all turned to the stranger, still standing firm. Stand behind me if you wish to live, he said. There was something both passionate and commanding about his voice. It was impossible to hear him and not heed his words. All of us stood up and ran behind the stranger as he lifted both hands. Debris climbed into the air. Cars, rocks, broken glass. The blobs were beginning to coagulate again, but this time the stranger wasn't going to let them get the upper hand again. With a slight nod, everything he'd raised flew at the blobs with the force of a machine gun. They were decimated. The bigger ones cut apart the smaller one fleeing to avoid the onslaught. After months of running from these monsters, I don't think any sight could have been more satisfying. When the creatures were gone, the stranger just gave a quiet sigh. He turned to us and asked if we were okay. The answer was, essentially, about as much as we can be. He told us that we'd be safe as long as we stuck with him. And after that display, we had every reason. We had every reason to believe him. We followed the stranger down the long, dark road. He always walked in the middle fearless, making no attempt to hide. When we asked him his name, he told us that he goes by many names, but for the sake of simplicity, we could call him Matthew. We thanked Matthew for saving us, and he gave a sad sort of smile, and told us that he only wished he could have done more. There was something so strange about Matthew, even beyond the fact he apparently had superpowers. I'd never met the man before, and I'd be willing to bet my right hand on that, and yet it felt like I'd known him my entire life. He was so different, and yet so incredibly familiar. We told them we were on our way to a nearby SCP Foundation facility, where we were told we'd find safe haven. We asked him if he knew where to find it. Matthew told us that, in fact, he'd lived there in that very site for decades. A visitor, just dropping in. He'd had a very stressful job before, and felt like taking a sabbatical while things ran themselves for once. Evidently, my help was more necessary than I imagined, he said. Occasionally, as we walked, we'd see blobs watching us from crevices and dark alleys on the side of the road. They seemed to watch, but for some reason didn't approach. It was the most remarkable thing. Don't worry, he told us. I'm putting up invisible shields. None of them can approach us as long as I maintain my focus. Of course, we'd all heard stories of remarkable and terrifying things wandering the wasteland we used to call planet Earth. You couldn't run into other survivors and groups without hearing whispers about the things lurking out there. Some had told of a giant monstrous reptile that had destroyed an entire survivor settlement in a mall outside of Nevada. Others told that one of those SCP sites was haunted. People spoke about a ghostly man who looked like a rotten corpse who could walk through walls and drag people to hell. But the things Matthew was capable of seemed to be on a whole other level. I asked him what he was, and he told me. Just a humble craftsman, my son. I enjoy creating, though admittedly my creations seem to have gotten away from me these days. His evasion was less funny than he seemed to think it was. I pressed on, asking him what exactly he was capable of. He shrugged and answered that he could do almost anything if he really put his mind to it. I asked, so, ultimate power? This gave him a chuckle. <laughs> he shook his head and said, Let me tell you a story. A man comes upon a maze cut into a cornfield and decides he wants to try his luck. He spends hours getting to the center of the maze, and there he finds the devil waiting for him. The devil says, Welcome to my domain. Your soul is now forfeit, unless you can complete my challenge and win it back. Of course, the men agreed. The devil said, I can see everything, do everything, and be everything. I know every inch of the universe and can produce anything from thin air. If you want to keep your soul, Name one thing I can't do. Curious, I asked, what did the man say? Matthew smiled and said, Get lost. 
And for the first time in those long, dark months, I actually laughed. And it was such a stupid, corny dad joke. It's a strange world we live in. Boy news. Matthew continued. There is no ultimate power. Some things are denied even to God, especially when he chooses to walk as a man on the earth he created. We kept walking for hours. Matthew assured us that we would get there in time, as the rest of us got even more anxious about the thought of the rising sun. He said he'd seen so many sunrises now that he could time them to the second. In the meantime, we should enjoy getting to stretch our legs a little. Even now, the city could be beautiful at night. When he led us all the way to what seemed like an abandoned chemical plant, I could feel my heart sink. All this time, all this work, to find more people, to find safety, only to see that this place was abandoned too. Matthew smiled and said, That's just what they want you to think. He snapped his fingers, and the ground around us began to rumble. The concrete shifted seamlessly, and an entrance opened up below. Heavy bulkheads shifted, revealing a sleek, chrome hallway down into the ground. We were astonished. Matthew gestured down into the hall as we descended. Matthew followed us, the entrance closing behind him. I'm just warning you, he said. This may come as a bit of a shock. We ventured deeper, passing through different automated security checkpoints as cameras gazed down from above. Eventually, we found ourselves in what seemed to be a central chamber. It was a hive of activity. People in normal civilian clothes, guards in tactical gear, scientists in lab coats. Tears filled my eyes. It was the most people I'd seen in one place in months. A man in a lab coat wearing an extravagant medallion approached. He was making notes on a clipboard. Another batch of survivors! Good work, 343! The man said. Matthew smiled and nodded. No problem, Jack. Always happy to help. The man with the medallion, Jack, presumably, turned to me. I imagine you've come a long way, he said. I nodded. <laughs> you have no idea. Another day, another failed attempt at death. If SCP-682 had anything even resembling a sense of humor, you might ask for it to be printed on a motivational poster and stuck to the side of his containment chamber, where he eternally melts and regrows at the mercy of high concentration acid. They just cross-tested him with Abel, again. Unlike some of the others he'd been forced to face, that tattooed swordsman seemingly wasn't intelligent enough to fear. He'd always come back, just as stupid and violent. This encounter had left the hard-to-destroy reptile at 30% of his previous body mass, bloody and bashed. He'd survived the encounter. He always survived. They brought what was left of him back to his cell in a forklift. A blasted forklift. How could it even be more humiliating? As his eyes started to grow back in his head, he could swear he even saw one of the technicians laughing at him. His name tag read, Agent Nigel Kelly, noted. 682 would specifically hunt down and kill him the next time he breached. Of course, every single day, he plotted revenge against the human race, along with everything else. But the sum they owed in pain, blood, and despair could never be repaid in full. After all, every single one of them, except <laughs> Dr. Bright, could only really die once. They'd brought 682 to the precipice a thousand times, only for his own body to cheat him and deprive him of the sweet release of death. And if the Foundation had their way, it would be done a thousand times more, and they wouldn't even stop there. 682 couldn't even imagine the number of containment breaches it would take to deal a blow even comparable to the one he had faced. All he could do was dream. Dream of a reckoning that would turn the tables. Something that would plunge humanity into the state of constant pain and terror that had been all he'd ever known since these fumbling sadists in white coats had locked him up here. What a beautiful day that would be. Little did SCP-682 know, that very day was about to break. Miles and miles away from the facility where SCP-682 was kept, after all, orders from the O5 Council have hard mandates on the minimum distances between people and a site holding a monster as volatile as 682. Parents watch their children laughing and frolicking in an idyllic playground. Some squealed with glee as they descended the slide, 
Some of the more ambitious little tykes tried to go over the bar on the swings. Others waited in line for some delicious soft serve at a parked ice cream truck. One mother brought an ice cream cone and walked over to a nearby bench, where she began to enjoy her delicious frozen treat. It was a remarkably hot day out, and a little ice cream was the perfect addition to her relaxation while her kids were occupied. You could see the distant air wobbling in the heat. Already her ice cream was starting to melt, white rivulets dribbling down the sides of the cone and onto her hands. Suddenly, almost imperceptibly, the quality of the light shifted. The kind of thing you'd dismiss as a trick of the eyes and forget just as quickly, were it not for the catastrophic effects that were about to unfold. As the woman leaned forward to lick her melting ice cream, something dripped onto her skirt. But as she looked down, she slowly realized that what dripped onto her wasn't the pure white of her ice cream. It was the same exact tone as her skin. She felt a terrible burning sensation all through her body, the most horrible, debilitating pain she'd ever experienced. Like every cell in her body was screaming and trying to make a break for it. She turned to the other parents sitting near the playground. They were screaming too. Each collapsed to the ground with agonizing slowness, different parts of their body falling at different speeds as they transitioned through states of matter. When they hit the ground, they were taking on a liquid state, screaming, worthless, boneless blobs. The woman even saw her own arm wilting like a time-lapse video of a dying flower. She dripped and sluiced through the cracks in the bench until nothing recognizably human was left. Only a soggy ice cream cone sitting uneaten. In an instant, billions of screams rang out over planet Earth. Day had broken. Things would never ever be the same again, as almost half of humanity instantaneously took on a liquid state. Needless to say, with the most dangerous and far-reaching anomalous incident in human history suddenly breaking out without any kind of warning, the SCP Foundation was incredibly busy. This would take some unprecedented action. The members of the O5 Council, who weren't melted during the initial blast, convened over secure video link while sequestering themselves underground in what amounted to multiple human lifetimes of some of the most high-pressure choices imaginable. They made the most difficult decision since the very beginning of the SCP Foundation. In the service of all mankind, they would now break the masquerade. The SCP Foundation would, at long last, step out of the shadows to save the rest of humanity from the tyranny of the light. Broadcasts went out all over the globe. Every TV screen, every live stream, every radio broadcast was commandeered. They gave instructions based on the scattered intel they had. For some reason, the sun had turned against them. Exposure would lead any biological creatures melting away into sentient piles of flesh-colored sludge. People would remain indoors and away from any light sources. All windows must remain covered, travel only at night, and even then, heavily covered with protective gear. There can only be one objective for whoever is left. Make your way to the nearest SCP Foundation containment facility and seek refuge inside. If anyone could figure out the answer to this terrifying existential riddle, it would be the SCP Foundation. Anyone who is exposed should be considered lost. While, as always, the SCP Foundation did all they could to project a sense of control over the situation, on the inside, it was pandemonium. Somehow, despite everything, this event had taken all of them by surprise. How could anyone have predicted that the cradle of our solar system's delicate living balance would suddenly become a meat grinder? A huge number of Foundation operatives were wiped out in the initial exposure. Global communication infrastructure had been devastated. It was pure chaos. And to SCP-682, as another evil tactician once put it, chaos was a ladder. From the inside of his acid tank, 6AV2 could sense the fear and pain suddenly exuding from his surrounding environment. It was greater than ever before. What was happening out there? This was no average containment breach. Something was really, really happening out there. 682 began to adapt and finally attune its hearing until it could pick up the chatter from outside. 
Uh, maybe we can convert some of the D-Class barracks into serviceable bunkers for the refugees. It's not like we're prepared for this kind of capacity. Oh god, oh god, we've lost Site-7, Site-10, Site-23, Site-40, Site-52. Site uh, death toll looks to be in the billions. Well, we don't know if they're dead technically, but they're sure as hell not human anymore. Oh, this is the big one. This is it. XK class. Even 2,000 is unaccounted for. Is L5 crazy that they think we're fighting the freaking sun? Needless to say, 682's curiosity was piqued. Anything that could light a fire under the foundation like this was something he could enjoy. And with his impressively strategic intellect, he intuited that a time of great strife for the foundation would be the perfect time to breach containment. Because whenever there's violence, fear, and chaos on a mass scale, SCP-682 will be there, causing it. 682 began adapting his pores and endocrine system to begin releasing a powerful alkaline substance. Little by little, the alkaline neutralized the acids surrounding him, turning it into little more than plain water. He then converted his internal systems to have extreme endothermic rather than exothermic properties, causing his surrounding temperature to drop rapidly until all the water in the tank completely froze around him. The ice expanded beyond the limit of the containment unit, busting the rivets of the metal frame and shattering the reinforced glass. With this goal achieved, 682 raised his internal temperatures to incredible highs, melting the ice around him. Once again, he was free and ready for some good old-fashioned carnage and mayhem. Perhaps he could get a better handle on this strange new situation too. It was all rather exciting. Just a girl with goals, huh? SCP Foundation personnel were already running around like ants trying desperately to avoid the caustic laser beam of the magnifying glass. You can only imagine how much worse it made matters when 682 suddenly burst through the wall Kool-Aid Man style and began to ruthlessly massacre everyone around him. Just one of those days, you know. The typical order during a 682 containment breach is to dispatch all available units to get him back under control. The issue with this particular containment breach was that, given the human population was very rapidly being melted, and they were the only ones who could potentially save the rest, they didn't really have any available units to pursue and recontain 682. For once, he really wasn't a priority, and that meant terrible things for whoever he ran into. 682 slaughtered his way through any researchers or guards who dared to get in his way. Disgusting creatures, really. Better off dead. He clawed and bit and tore and crushed with almost childlike glee, leaving great piles of bodies in his wake. All the while, he was pondering the things he heard those Foundation drones saying. Something about the sun and an XK-class scenario. Hmm, interesting. 682 also observed that any apertures that could potentially allow light into the facility had also been shuttered. Perhaps they weren't overreacting this time like they always did with him. Maybe they were dealing with some kind of phenomenon that would now cast this wretched world and those who lived in it into the void. Wouldn't that be a fitting karmic fate for them all? Still, 682's bloodlust didn't outweigh his logic. He needed to know more about the situation before proceeding, and in this, maybe he could kill two Foundation birds with one stone. Elsewhere in the building, alarms blared. The air was suffused with panicked voices and frequent screams. Nobody knew what was going on. Not really. They'd only gotten details here and there, and the details they'd received were terrifying. All their families and loved ones outside, probably gone. So many of the people in so much of the world they'd been fighting for, risking it all for, had disappeared in an instant carried to hell on a ray of sunshine. Why were they still here? Was this horror not truly uncontainable? These questions were swimming through the mind of Agent Nigel Kelly as he stood alone in his office, almost catatonic. He'd had his friends and family on the outside, all likely reduced to those horrible fleshy blobs. He was alone in the world, risking his life for nothing. How could this get any worse? His mind kept repeating that question again and again and again, and the universe gave him an answer in the form of a deep reptilian voice saying, Found you. into his ear from behind. 
He turned with a shriek to see the terrible eyes of 682 staring into his own. Before he could try to flee or reach for a weapon that he knew would only mildly annoy the already furious beast, 682 reached out with a massive clawed hand and grabbed him by the torso, lifting him up into the air. The creature was gripping so tight that he could feel his ribs starting to crack. You laughed at me, Agent Kelly. The monster hissed. Am I funny too? Do I see you have the time to tell jokes? Do you feel like laughing now? Agent Kelly begged and pleaded for his life, fighting for his next breath from the crushing squeeze of the creature's terrible hand. 682 roared at him to be silent and ordered him to tell him everything he knew about the situation going on outside. If the information was useful, 682 might show his thought-to-be-non-existent magnanimous side and let Agent Kelly live. Of course, Agent Kelly didn't fancy his chances, but what other choice did he have? He told 682 that the higher-ups were calling this SCP-001 when day breaks. The sun had gone rogue somehow, and being in contact with any kind of sunlight would now cause people to instantaneously melt into horrifying, living sludge. And it wasn't just people. The condition also affected anomalies, and interestingly, it appeared to negate all previous anomalous effects, so 682's adaptational ability may not even save it if it was exposed. He told 682 everything he knew. Are you, are you gonna let me live? Agent Kelly asked, struggling to breathe. 682's terrible maw twisted into what might have been a smile. Oh, Agent Kelly, he said with unsettling joy. That was a joke. Didn't you find that one funny? A terrible scream emanated from the agent's office. If one good thing could be said for what happened to Agent Kelly that day, at least he didn't live long enough to see the ravages of the terrible sun firsthand. 682 began to formulate a plan. He took Agent Kelly's wristwatch and integrated it into his body so he'd have a permanent internal clock. It was the middle of summer, so the sun would have reliably set at 9 p.m. and would likely begin its rise around 5 a.m. It would be relatively easy to avoid the sun, all things considered. For lack of a more eloquent way to put it, when it comes to adapting to new threats, SCP-682 is simply built different. After slaughtering a few other members of SCP Foundation staff for the road, hey, it's not like anyone was fit to stop him, 682 began enacting the new phase of his plan. His body grew a thick, smooth carapace, and his front set of limbs began to grow, his muscles bulging and his claws growing, the tips turning into sharp, flat scoops. With sudden and tremendous force, 682 began boring his way into the ground, tunneling, clawing through concrete and dirt with absolute ease. Normally, the SCP Foundation would have deployed high-tech seismic sensors and the kind of tunnel boring machines that Elon Musk could only dream of to intercept and recapture him. But during the endless horrors of the breaking day, he had carte blanche to escape and live it up in the ruins of this rapidly dying world. Eventually, 682 had bored his way into a roomy sewer pipe, the perfect place to wait out a few hours. Up above, so many millions screamed, either in fear or in agony. There had been some new developments that the SCP Foundation had been yet to account for. While they knew that those melted by the rogue sun were technically alive and trapped in a permanent state of suffering, what the Foundation didn't know was that these former humans were incredibly dangerous in their own right. The sun hadn't just irreparably warped their bodies, it had also irreparably warped their minds. It has enslaved them, made them zealots, acolytes. They developed the instinct to coagulate into giant fleshy masses, driven by the single-minded purpose of finding victims and dragging them into the light, where they too could be converted into these terrible fleshy creatures and add to the masses. They were the rogue sun's boots on the ground, metaphorically speaking. And now they were the Foundation's greatest challenge in getting a handle on this situation again. Before, it was just encouraging people to avoid the sun. Now, the sun was actively trying to increase its exposure. But 682, who was having a relaxing evening not being melted for once down in the sewers, couldn't care less. 
He was having the most calming few hours he'd had in years. He waited, checking the time, making sure that it would be dark before he began tunneling back up to the surface world. He surfaced in the middle of the city, miles away from the Foundation facility he'd spent so many decades being tortured in. He tasted the cool night air and observed the desolation that had been wrought all around him. Buildings were on fire. Cars were crashed and overturned. The ground was cracked. Garbled SCP Foundation public service announcements played to nobody in the broken display windows of electronic stores. Giant wads of human flesh roamed, slithering around, searching for new victims. One noticed 682 and began to approach him, gibbering madly in a chorus of strange voices. The hard-to-destroy reptile wasted no time in attacking. It tore apart most of the hideous blob and began hungrily devouring the chunks. The form may have been different, but it still tasted like human flesh, and SCP-682 savored every bite. It would be so simple. These blobs of idiotic flesh were so easy to kill, and there would be so many terrified humans in this devastated world, hiding away in dark places, holding out the hope that maybe they could reach the safety of a Foundation facility. 682 chuckled at the very thought, Foolish hope would drown in an endless well of black, caustic despair. He would find them. He would rest underground in the day and then hunt them in the dark. They would all die screaming, bloodying his claws and fangs. Nothing and nobody would stop him. He looked out over this strange new world and laughed a little louder. <laughs> It was just delightful. Lewis Jackson sat with all his fellow students in the dingy underground lecture hall, listening to a rickety old professor with a voice like chloroform, rattling off dry facts about economics. Above him, a projector older than any of the students in the room covered the wall in a poorly designed PowerPoint presentation, limping from slide to slide. It was 9 a.m. on a thoroughly unremarkable Monday. Half the class was hung over. The other was just terminally bored. Lewis hoped none of this would come up on the final, because this morning, he had no intention of listening. Instead, he was typing out a message under the desk with a big, <laughs> stupid grin on his face. Professor Harbison is going off about the free market again. Save me. Send. The message's recipient, Jenny Park, started typing. Lewis's crush on Jenny was the college's worst-kept secret. Ever since they met during O-Week, he'd been infatuated with her. They shared a few classes, but little by little, they started hanging out more in their free time. Study sessions, grabbing lunch together, going to the movies. They'd become fast friends, but Lewis was hoping they could be something more, and he hoped deep down Jenny was thinking the same thing. He received a text. We can hang out in the quad after if it makes him easier to endure. We'll grab burgers. My treat. With a winking emoji. Lewis felt like a dork to admit it. Even to himself. But this message made his heart race. They were doing winking emojis now. Maybe today wouldn't be such a drag after all. Any day that he got to hang out with Jenny couldn't be all that bad. All this news was so exciting to him, he didn't notice that something strange was sweeping over the lecture hall. While the professor droned on, even the most studious members of the class were suddenly checking their phones, faces alight with expressions of confusion, then concern, then worry. Something was happening. Something big. Professor Harbison fell silent as a new sound rose to prominence, muffled at first but getting rapidly louder just outside the lecture hall. It was screaming, terrible screams of fear and pain. People started to rise out of their seats. What was going on out there? Nobody had heard gunshots or an explosion. The ground wasn't rumbling under their feet, and if a hurricane or tornado was tearing its way across the campus, they would have heard it. Suddenly, the main doors to the lecture hall burst open, and a terrified student rushed through. Lewis recognized him. It was Tommy Lansdale a history major that Lewis had hung out with a few times at campus parties. He was a chill guy, the kind of person who took everything on the chin and let life's troubles just roll off his back. 
That's why it was so strange to see his whole body shaking and his face a red mess of tears. He can't go out there, he screamed. There's something wrong with the light. Concern was starting to give way to panic. Tommy turned and shoved the bolt into place on the door, eliminating the potential exit. The only other way out was a fire escape down by the stage. His heavy breathing and choked sobs weren't doing much to calm anyone down. Lewis checked his phone again. Jenny was still typing. Tommy kept repeating, Something's wrong with the light! Something's wrong with the light! Something's wrong with the light! The other students were starting to approach him, all with a sense of guarded caution, given they still didn't understand the situation well enough to know for sure that Tommy wasn't the dangerous one here. College could be an extremely stressful place. It definitely wasn't unheard of for people to snap under the pressure and do something they wouldn't normally do. What? What's going on, man? Lewis said, walking briskly up to Tommy, worried about Jenny's safety if something really was happening out there. Tommy raised both hands in a gesture that seemed halfway between pleading and a threat, shaking his head frantically. Stay back, dude. You don't want to go out there. Something terrible is happening. Professor Harbison approached, adjusting his glasses and sneering. He didn't take kindly to someone interrupting his lecture with these ridiculous theatrics. An institute of learning was no place for this kind of troublemaker. I demand you leave this instant, young man, Harbison said. If you don't stop this foolish behavior, I'll have you written up. Tommy didn't budge. He just shook his head emphatically. I'm not going anywhere, he said. If you go out there, you're gonna die. I'm not letting anyone leave this damn building. Before anyone could protest this unwilling confinement, a terrible sound started to come from outside. Not screaming this time, just a voice. A warped, pained voice that seemed almost to droop as it spoke, like a voice recorded on an old reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder that's starting to degrade. Help me. It slurred. Please, let me in. I feel so sick. There was a terrible slopping noise, like a thick, viscous liquid sluicing closer. Tommy looked down and screamed. Flesh-colored slime was slithering in underneath the door and dripping over the top step of the gangway. Tommy stepped back, along with everyone else. It looked revolting and smelled even worse, like a mixture of rotten meat and burning hair. That terrible, drooping voice was still somehow emanating from the slime. Please, please help me. Something went wrong. Naturally, the other students began to scream and run. Whatever that monster was, they needed to get away from it quickly. Only Lewis seemed to be rooted in place, the terror and impossibility of it all just paralyzing him. He could only watch as the flesh-colored blob creature seeped in under the door. Everything else, including Professor Harbison, who was moving faster than he had in years, made a mad dash for the fire exit down by the stage. Tommy screamed for them to stay inside, but it was already too late. People panicked and piled on top of each other to get out, but the second they did, the worst of the screaming started. The most awful, agonized wails you've ever heard that tapered off in that same drooping gurgle as the blob slithered in underneath the door. It was Lewis's natural instinct to run down and help somehow, but instead he felt Tommy's white knuckle grip on his shoulder. <laughs> I'm sorry, Tommy said through the sobs. It's too late for them. There's nothing you can do, man. We just need to stay inside. At that moment, Lewis received a text message from Jenny. It read, Lewis, if you're still okay, you need to read this and you need to believe me. Something terrible has happened. So many people are dead. Or at least I think they're dead. A lot of them are still screaming. I think it has something to do with the sun. Stay out of the light. I'm in Administration Building C. I'm safe for now, but I'm hiding. Don't come looking for me until nightfall. Please let me know if you're okay. You can't trust the sun. Lewis felt a wave of relief and terror wash over him. Jenny was okay, and that was great news. But it seemed like this nightmare, whatever the hell it was, was affecting everyone out there. It was a force melting people down and turning them into monsters. The screams from outside the door were getting worse. All those people who had been, well, people, so recently were something entirely different now, and they were in terrible, terrible pain. 
Lewis and Tommy ran down to the fire escape next to the stage and forced it shut, trying not to look at the tide of liquid flesh that was rolling in the apparently hostile sun outside. They were lost now. Tommy and Lewis didn't want them coming back in. Lewis breathed a rattling sigh and hammered out a reply to Jenny. I'm safe in a lecture hall with Tommy Lansdale. We'll come to you as soon as we can. Don't worry, it's all gonna be okay. Lewis shoved his phone back into his pocket. Mm. Now isn't the time to keep checking. He asked Tommy what he knew, how he had survived, whatever all this was. Having some kind of knowledge about what they were dealing with might have given them a better chance of surviving. Tommy had just finished up a seminar in a nearby classroom and was headed over to the canteen to grab a Reuben while preparing for his next class. He was lucky enough to be under a covered walkway, bathed in the early morning shade, when something about the sun changed. It was hard to even describe. A certain shift in the quality of the light, a kind of shimmer, almost. It didn't affect him, but the people in the courtyard a few feet away. He was shuddering as he told the next part of the story. He swallowed hard over a lump in his throat, staring off into the distance with a haunted look as the memories played over his mind. Tommy described the people in the courtyard, the ones out of the shade who were first exposed. They just started screaming and falling apart, losing form, melting, becoming awful piles of shapeless slop on the ground. It was instantaneous, and all it seemed to take was a fraction of a second of sun exposure for the whole process to take effect. Nothing was worth the risk of exposure to something like that. Nothing. But Lewis disagreed. There was one thing worth risking his life or the integrity of his body for. Jenny. They had to get to Administration Building C as quickly as possible. And not just because of the new threat raging outside, but because Building C already had a certain reputation. Rumor had it that a number of people had gone missing in that building back in the 1970s. Since then, people had experienced strange, inexplicable things, odd chills, strange noises, creeping feelings of doom in certain areas. In short, it was the last place Lewis wanted Jenny to be trapped, but neither he nor Tommy could help until night fell, seeing as they wouldn't be great rescuers in a semi-liquid state. They waited for ten torturous hours in that lecture hall, as day turned to night outside. In that time, they heard so many terrible bubbling screams out there, pain trying to escape a slimy prison. It was enough to drive you mad with fear. Both checked the news and their Twitter feeds on their phones, hoping to find out if there was any more information on what was happening out there. It seemed the worst had come to pass. This insane phenomenon was unfolding everywhere. People across the world were suffering under the transforming rays of the terrible new sun. Some group called the SCP Foundation was releasing information about it, telling people to come towards their buildings at night for safety. Lewis committed this fact to memory. When they'd collected Jenny, they'd head straight to one of these buildings. Hopefully, someone out there could tell them what the hell was going on here. Someone out there had to have answers about all of this. When it got dark outside, Lewis felt his phone buzz in his pocket as he received another text from Jenny. This time it was, Lewis, I'm scared. Please come quickly. I'm downstairs. And with that, Lewis knew it was time to leave. He and Tommy steeled themselves, and when they were sure it was dark out, they ventured forth from the lecture hall and onto the quad. There they saw the aftermath of the horrors that the sun had wrought. The grass was covered in more huge, flesh-colored blobs, slithering across the grass like mutant slugs. Just the sight of them made Lewis and Tommy feel nauseous, but they didn't have time to stop and take a breather. If Jenny was in trouble, they needed to get to Building C fast. It looked even more frightening at night. It occurred to both Lewis and Tommy, at that moment, that neither of them had ever actually been inside this building before, and what seemed like the end of the world was certainly an interesting time to start. Lewis and Tommy entered the building and turned on the lights in the lobby. They heard a voice at first, oddly toneless and robotic, but soon realized it was a video playing on loop on the computer at the unmanned reception desk. It was another message from the SCP Foundation. This is a public service announcement from the SCP Foundation. We are commandeering all broadcast channels and frequencies to deliver a vital message. Avoid sunlight at all costs. 
Cover your bodies thoroughly and follow the instructions on the screen to reach the nearest operational SCP Foundation containment site. Neither like the sound of the phrase containment site, but they'd worry about the semantics later. Jenny had said she'd been hiding downstairs, and there was no sign of her here on the first floor, so it stood to reason she was on some kind of basement level. Strange. It seemed like all the doors here led up, except one. A door that looked like, until very recently, it had been bolted to the wall. Well, Lewis said, trying to mask his fear, I guess it's now or never. Tommy opened his mouth to answer, but before a single word could pass his lips, a huge, fleshy tendril shot through the front door of the building and wrapped around his throat. He managed only a choked gasp as it dragged him back towards the door. On the other side of the threshold, a mountain of flesh eagerly waited. A gibbering nightmare of half-formed faces screamed and wailed in the terrible fleshy form. It happened so quickly that Lewis couldn't even hope to save him. He was gone, subsumed by the blob, his face disappearing into the flesh before Lewis could even scream. But there was no time to stop and process the shock. Another several tendrils were already reaching for him. He could practically see it happening in slow motion, pulsing, grasping for him. Perhaps it was only his will to see Jenny again that gave him the strength to do so, but he dodged the tendrils by a fraction of an inch and dove towards the door, the same door he assumed Jenny had escaped into hours earlier. He threw open the door and disappeared behind it, slamming it in place and holding it fast. He could feel the tendrils smashing up against it, hammering away. Lewis heard all those terrible, deranged voices screaming for him on the other side. He was holding it for a solid ten minutes before the creature finally gave up and slithered away. The second the silence fell, Lewis's phone buzzed in his pocket again. He fished it out and saw another message from Jenny. It read, Please come. Afraid. So dark here. So dark here. So dark here. So dark here. And it was at that moment that Lewis began to take in his new surroundings. He was standing in a stairwell, one that seemed much older and more dilapidated than even the rest of the building. But most notable of all was the fact that he had never, ever seen a place so dark. Impossibly dark. Not dark as in the absence of light, but dark as in an almost physical presence choking out the light. Even with his phone on full power, the light didn't penetrate much of the black. Was Jenny all the way down here? Lewis was afraid. He could only imagine how Jenny was feeling down there in the depths. He took a deep breath and started descending down into the darkness, using his phone camera to light what little of the way was possible. The deeper he got, the more he started to feel a strange, intangible dread beginning to creep in, like an invisible hand compressing his chest. As he got deeper, he noticed a sound quiet weeping, an unmistakably female voice somewhere down below. It sounded too young to be Jenny, but then again Lewis had never actually heard her cry before. Whatever the case, he needed to get down there and remedy the situation. He forged on further and further into the dark, even as his terrible sense of dread increased. He couldn't help but notice that no matter how far down he went, it always sounded like the crying was the same distance away. It unnerved him. But Jenny had to be down there. She had to be. And even if he gave up on her, it's not like he could just go back up and leave. There were monsters out there, like the monster that had gotten Tommy. Even down here in the darkness, he was safer than up there. Or at least, that's what he thought. He felt something strange under his foot and looked down. It was an old piece of torn up orange fabric with D9884 written on it. The phone buzzed again. A new message from Jenny. This time it read, I can see you. Can you see me? Lewis looked around. He couldn't see anything. He tried desperately calling Jenny again. He yelled her name until his voice went hoarse. No reply. Just that same soft weeping so far below. Maybe she was on the flight below him. She must have been close. He doubled his speed, vaulting down the stairs to the next level when he noticed something on the ground. A smartphone. One that, over so many study dates, lunches, and outings to the movies, he learned to recognize. It was Jenny's. He picked it up, studying it, only to see that it was dead. The screen cracked and the battery lifeless. 
His own phone gave another buzz. A text from Jenny. It read, look down. And against all rational thought, that's exactly what he did. There was something at the bottom of the stairs. A strange, pale face somehow illuminated in the darkness. At first he thought it could have been her and ran towards it. By the time he realized he was wrong, and he was staring into the blank eyes of a face without a mouth inches from his own face, it was already too late. Lewis let out a scream. There was nobody there to hear him. But on the bright side, at least he never would see that sunlight again. The sun's gone bad. People and animals are melting everywhere. The world is coming to an end and there's nothing I can do about it. Will I be able to find food? Will I be able to defeat or avoid the horrific flesh monsters all around me? Or the desperate and hungry survivors left in this terrible new world? Keep watching and find out. Can I survive 100 days in SCP-001 when day breaks? Hey folks, it's your boy Kyle. You probably know me more for gaming videos than post-apocalyptic vlogs, but hey, I'm a versatile guy, and I think I might go insane from the fear if I don't talk to somebody about all this craziness. If you're alive and seeing this right now, well, congratulations, you're probably doing a lot better than most people here, if you call them people now. But if you're seeing this a few years in the future, like, I don't know, you woke up from a 10-year coma, like Rick from The Walking Dead, and you're wondering what the hell happened to planet Earth, this video is probably going to answer a lot of your questions. First things first, whatever you do, you've got to stay away from the sun. It touches you. For even a second, you're dead. Or worse. Welcome to day one of the end of the world. For all of you who are still in a solid state of matter, you're probably wondering how I'm still alive too. Chances are it's for the exact same reason you are. Sheer dumb luck. I was down here in my gaming basement when day broke, just level grinding, when my TV got taken over by those SCP Foundation people, telling us that the sun's gone evil for whatever reason and now we've all got to stay inside. Hell, if I was up there making myself a sandwich or grabbing another can of Mountain Dew, I'd be a freaking puddle right now. It's funny, my mom always told me spending all day indoors was bad for me. I'll have to mention that to her if she's alive. Point is, the world has gone to hell in a handbasket and now I've got only one objective, survive. I'm going to see if I can survive the horrifying post-apocalyptic world of when day breaks. For this first day, I'm just gonna hunker down. I kinda hope this is just a dream. Day two, all right, I'm up and at him, baby. Sadly, I can now report that this isn't a dream. This really is our horrible new reality. It's the sun's world, and we're just living in it. I've been spending the last several hours just waiting for nightfall outside. Against all odds, the internet and the power grid haven't gone down yet. Guess what's ever wrong with the sun only affects people and animals, not objects. Thank heaven for small mercies, right? People on Twitter have been live posting their situations out there, sharing advice on how we might all be able to stay out of the sun and survive this whole crazy thing. And hey, unless they're dead or full of hot air, maybe those SCP Foundation people know something about what's going on here. If we really can get to their buildings, maybe we can figure out how to reverse all this mess. Maybe. For now, I'm just gonna focus on staying alive. Hopefully, night hits soon. I really need to use the bathroom. Oh boy, it's day three and new issues are starting to pop up. I've been heading upstairs to go to the bathroom, but while I don't want to be crude, I'm running low on toilet paper and it's um starting to become a problem. I ran out of my last roll a few days ago and now I'm starting to go to my bookshelves. I have a few newspapers left that I tore up and used for toilet paper first. Um, they weren't exactly comfortable, but hey, you need to make do. But without toilet paper and without newspapers, I need to figure out what my favorite and least favorite books are. I'm starting with the prefaces of all the books, seeing as I don't generally need to reread them. You know, they're expendable, you know? A lot of these books I haven't read since I was like 15, so maybe those will be the ones. I can't make up my mind on whether I'm gonna use the Harry Potter books or the Percy Jackson and the Olympian books first. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments. I guess. I need to go to the bathroom. Day four, and now I'm trying to figure out how to pass the time. As you already know, I'm an avowed lifelong gamer. So while the electricity and the internet still work, I'm gonna keep gaming to pass the time and keep my all too precious sanity. I still have no intention of going out there even at night, but it's left me feeling kind of stir crazy. I wanna walk around the city again. I wanna go for a drive and feel the breeze in my hair. But seeing as I can't do that without experiencing a truly horrifying transformation, I've been spending a lot of time on GTA 5 online. Guess we'll never get GTA 6 now. 
What a bummer. Still, these last few days, it's felt more like Los Santos has been my home than where I actually live. There were even a few other people on the server. I don't know about you, but I take some comfort in that. Hey folks, I'm back, thankfully. Welcome to day five. We've still got electricity, thankfully, hence why you can still see this. I haven't heard anything from my family, and I don't want to assume the worst, but it's probably just best not to think about it. I've been heading up and downstairs to grab more food at night. You're probably wondering, but Kyle, why don't you bring it all downstairs to save going up altogether? Which I'd say, I don't have a fridge downstairs. <laughs> Smartass. But I'm starting to realize food is going to be a real issue here. It's kind of stupid now that I think about it. In all the zombie movies and TV shows I used to watch, it was all bullets and baseball bats killing your way through all those undead freaks and worrying about the rest later. Guess they don't want you to think about how you're only gonna ever be a couple weeks away from starvation. Kinda ruins the badass post-apocalyptic power fantasy. I only have a couple days worth of food left here, and after that, I'm gonna need to go out and search for more. Or I'm gonna need to relocate. I don't feel comfortable here anymore, you know? Early on, I thought when you got exposed to the sunlight, it just killed you, but no, it's worse. You keep living, you're just changed into one of those things. These last few days, I've looked out the windows when I've come up at night for food. I, I see them sometimes slithering in the yard or down the street. These things that used to be people. I wonder if they're people that I knew once before all this. And I tried to shove the thought out of my mind. Freaking myself out about all this doesn't help. I know that much. I just keep thinking about how they move. This like weird kind of purpose. Like they're searching for something, but what could they be searching for? I'm just gonna go and get more food. We'll speak again soon. Stay safe, whoever you are. <sighs> Welcome to day six. It's nighttime now and I'm heading out for the first time. I keep seeing these weird, slimy creatures everywhere and they make me kind of sick to look at them, but I try my best to just keep moving. I'm on a mission tonight. I'm gonna go to the local supermarket and check to see if there's still food there, while also grabbing myself a quick snack. I'm gonna keep this one brief. I don't wanna do a full shopping spree tonight. It's already too late. Just need to know the food is there. I decided earlier in the night if I survive this thing and the getting is good at the bargain mark, I'll make my way back tomorrow for something a little more, you know, substantial. After all the fewer trips I make out, the safer I'm likely to be. By the time I made it to the supermarket though, while I was practically a nervous wreck from the fear of turning into one of those things, I made an amazing discovery. While the windows were broken and the floor was a mess, most of the food was still there. Day seven, or should I say night seven. Galvanized by my success from the previous days, I decided to come back to the supermarket with a shopping cart. I wanted to get enough food for at least a week so I wouldn't need to come back out again. Hey, maybe I'm not so bad at this whole apocalypse thing after all. I grabbed plenty of canned food from the supermarket. Most of the perishables had already gone moldy by the time I showed up, so fresh fruit was out of the question. Suddenly I started getting scared about the thought of scurvy, but pushed it quickly from my mind. I'd cross that bridge when I got to it. Hey, hey, it's day eight and I'm still kicking. That's gotta count for something, right? I started taking more trips out at nighttime just to stretch my legs and keep the blood flowing. When the slithering things that were once people pass me, I just make myself scarce and hide in the shadows. You know, I, I hear them muttering sometimes in like this melted voice or voices. It's unsettling, but it's amazing what you'll get used to in just over a week. It's eerie to see all these streets without people in them. I know that I should probably just stay inside, but I, I really can't. I don't know if this will ever just stop, and if it doesn't, I, I don't want to spend my last days cooped up in my own basement. <sighs> Day 9. You know, there are some benefits to being in the post-apocalypse, to ever so slightly offset all the utterly crushing downsides. Well, during the day, we're all prisoners of the sun in our own homes. At night, we can do whatever the hell we want. I took a baseball bat that I keep in my closet and went to the local furniture store. I smashed up every single vase and all the windows like one of those rage rooms, because Nobody could stop me. Then afterwards, I went straight to the local computer and gaming store and took all the Alienware tech I could physically carry. You know, there's no value in money anymore. If you want something, you can just go and take it. Every cloud has a silver lining. Day 10. More GTA 5 today. 
I decided to get on my headset and speak to a few others who were still around and on the servers. You know, it was so nice to speak to other human beings for once. They came from all over the world and were dealing with the same evil sun and sanity as me. You have no idea how incredibly valuable it is to find people to talk to in a time like this. The other players had plenty of theories as to why all this had happened. Some thought it was some kind of mutant solar flare they'd remembered reading about on some conspiracy forum back in the day. Others speculated it was the result of some weapon created by the US or Russian or Chinese military that had gone wrong. One person said that maybe it was a punishment from God, like maybe on some level we all deserved it. You know, things got pretty quiet after that. Day 11. I've been having the most terrible nightmares lately. It's probably just a product of all the stress I've been under lately, but in the nightmares I'm running down a dark street being chased by those flesh creatures. I'm moving fast, but they're moving way faster. They're whispering to me, but I can't make out anything they're saying. This morning, which is to say evening, I woke up screaming and drenched in sweat. I can't really explain why, but I feel like something terrible is gonna happen soon. Okay, okay, I'm alive. That's enough, isn't it? And if you're watching this, I assume you're alive too. Congratulations, welcome to the nightmare space between day 11 and day 27. Sorry that I haven't been in contact for so long. As you can see, I'm not at home anymore. You couldn't pay me to go back there. <laughs> Not that money is worth anything anymore. A lot's happened since I last made one of these and I wish I could tell you any of it was good. Hell, I wish I could forget it all, but the things I've seen and heard, I don't think they're ever gonna leave my head no matter what I do. I thought about making another entry now and then, but I always found a reason to put it off. It's remarkable how your other priorities fall away when you're just thinking about where your next meal is coming from. It just kind of puts everything into perspective. Of course, during my travels, I saw more of those freaks slithering around. Sorry, sorry, I, I know I shouldn't call them that. It's kind of a coping mechanism, you know? It all gets a lot harder when you have to think of them as ex-people. That's another thing all these goofy zombie shows got wrong. It's a lot harder to separate what they were from what they are now, especially when, you know, these were your friends, your neighbors, your... Well, I can't avoid talking about it forever, can I? I stuffed my backpack with whatever I could grab and left my home two nights ago. It wasn't just because I was going stir-crazy back there, though I admit that didn't exactly help. It was what happened there. I just came back from a food run, put most of it in the fridge, then retired back down into the basement to enjoy a late night snack and do a little gaming to keep myself sane. I'd been doing everything I could to reverse my circadian rhythms and sleep during the day just so I could be fully operational during the 12 hour period that going outside wouldn't melt me. But just like all those stories they told us when we were kids, there are monsters out there at night and they are looking for us. When I first heard the sound, I was, I wondered if it was something in game or maybe dripping from a leaky pipe. But no, it was too close to be fake and too viscous to be water. That's when I looked at the door and saw this awful pink slime slithering its way underneath my door. It was one of those things, those ex people trying to get in. That'd be bad enough, but then it started talking to me. Kyle, my darling. Why are you all cooped up down here? It isn't healthy. You ought to come outside, sweetie. Get some sun, my darling. It was my mom. Well, it used to be. I guess she wanted to come over and visit me. Needless to say, I got out of there and I've got no intention of going back. That place is dead to me now. I don't even want to think about that voice ever again. Both her and... So, not her. So now I'm on the move. Guess I'll speak to you again when I stop. Stay safe out there. Day 28. I decided it was best to make my way out of town towards the fringes. The day first broke, the people who were in the most densely populated areas were the first to go. That's why I decided to hole up in a gas station last night just to avoid the sun. But during the night, people came. Not ex-people, actual people. They showed up in a jeep outside the building, refueled and then came in. They were wearing black, cobbled together outfits and hockey masks. They were all either carrying bats or axes too. You can probably understand why I didn't decide to introduce myself when they busted their way in. I concealed myself in a broom closet while they searched around. It was nerve shredding. I'd never been more thankful in my life when they left. Day 29, coming up on a month of this madness. After the incident at the gas station, I realized I needed some kind of defense. It's not just the sun and those creatures I need to worry about. 
Just like the old world, people could be dangerous here too. That's why I snuck into a gun store in the dead of night. Some of it had been looted, but much like the supermarket near my house, there was plenty still here. The walls were covered in all manner of rifles, shotguns, and even submachine guns. I heard somewhere that revolvers are more reliable and easy to maintain than other types, so since I'm a gun novice, I grabbed a revolver and stuffed my pockets with as many bullets as I could carry. Let's hope I never have to use any of them. Day 30. Do I get to call this a month of survival? I mean, if we're talking February, I'd be a month in already. What a horribly dubious honor that is. I saw something disgusting last night, and I thought I'd share it just to get it off my mind. Last night, as I was moving through the wilderness, I saw a group of other survivors gathered around a campfire. I remained scarce, but approached just to see what was going on, still carrying my revolver just to be safe. But the people around the campfire were eating something, and when I saw what they were eating, I swear to God, I almost threw up. They were chopping up one of the ex-people, hooking the parts over the fire, and eating it. Day 31, a month by anyone's definition. Ever since seeing those others eating one of the ex-people, I've had trouble eating even normal food myself. My stomach aches and my throat burns. God, I feel so weak. I keep laying down and resting. I know I need to eat soon if I want to survive to day 32, but every time I think about eating, I think about the gooey flesh of the ex-people. Sometimes I wish I hadn't survived this long. I'll eat soon. I just need to sleep first. Day 32 to 43. If you live this long, you really ought to be proud of yourself. I've seen thousands of those slimy ex-people, and there's probably millions more out there. Hell, maybe even billions if we're being honest with ourselves here. Am I just talking into the void here? Is there even anyone else out there who's human enough to watch this stuff? <sighs> Maybe I just need to keep thinking about posterity. On the off chance that the world ever gets better and we reach some time where children are born again and all this fades from human memory, you'll still have these stupid, pointless little videos to remember how awful all this was. That way, at least I can make myself believe this all had some kind of, I don't know, point? So what's happened? With me, not much. Still moving at night, surviving, hiding in closets and underground parking complexes during daylight, I'm down to uh, my last few cans, so I'm hoping to hit a supermarket soon. God, what a ridiculous way to go. Starving in this new world with so many new, interesting ways to die. With the ex-people, things have been a little more eventful. There used to be one blob to a person, but they've started joining up. That's the best way I can put it. Things that used to be people and animals are starting to melt together, getting bigger and bigger. They've never been aggressive, but I think it's best to stay out of their way. Whatever all this is about, I am streetwise enough to know that it can't be anything good. I'll just keep moving and I hope you can do the same, whoever the hell you are. Hopefully the next time I check in with you, it's with better news than this. Day 44. I saw a shootout on the road last night. The people who are left, the ones who are still indeed people, are becoming less human. Something about situations like this, this sustained stress and pain and hopelessness, it weighs on you. There are no rules in the post-apocalypse. The only thing that can stop you from doing anything is a bullet to the head. Five or six people last night, as afraid and desperate and hungry as me, gunned each other down. They did this for reasons I will never understand, even if I wanted to, because there are no survivors left to tell the tale. What a funny world we live in. Day 45. I sleep when I can. It's surreal. I remember when I feared the dark and loved bright sunny days. Even all this time in, I still don't think I'm used to the switch being flipped. I've been having awful dreams again. I'm still running in them with a deep red sun shining up in the sky. I'm being chased by a mountain of flesh the size of Mount Everest. It's swallowing up the city behind me and it keeps getting closer. No matter how fast I go, I just, I, I can't escape. They'll get me eventually. Something terrible is going to happen soon. I just know it. Day 46. I shot a man today. I don't know if he survived. I hope he lived. We encountered each other inside an abandoned building. I think we spooked each other and didn't have any time to ask if we were friends or foes. We were too afraid either way. We both drew our weapons and I was faster than he was. When my revolver discharged and he collapsed, I ran off. Sun would come up in a few hours and I just needed to find another place to hide. What the hell have I become? I don't know how things could get any worse than this. Note to self, in the future, 
don't even dare to think, how could things get any worse? Because if I've learned anything since this whole nightmare started, that is never a rhetorical question. Welcome to the space between day 47 and day 64. If you're still alive and watching this, I am so sorry. So I've got good news and I've got bad news. I'll give you the good news first. I've seen more people who haven't been changed yet. And the bad news? Last time I saw them, they were being dragged out into the light, kicking and screaming in the tendrils of one of those horrible flesh monsters I was telling you about last time. They've gotten a lot bigger now. And when I told you they weren't aggressive, well, um, yeah, I, I spoke a little too soon. I can't just sleep during the day like I used to. These monsters, and that's what they are now. They're monsters, not people anymore. They patrol, they hunt, they actively enter buildings searching for hiding places, searching for people they can drag out into the light. I've seen it with my own two eyes. The second they're out, they'll just start melting and fusing with the mass, making it even bigger, adding another voice to the chorus. And I hate myself, because every time I've seen it happen, all I can think is, thank God that's not me. God, I wish I could do something to help, to save them. But that's not the world we live in. The second they touch the light, it is already over. I wouldn't be helping anyone by adding my flesh to one of those things. I don't want them using my body to get to other people. There's only one thing I can do now. Keep moving at night, stay hidden, get away from population centers. Hmm. I've realized where I need to go now. I've still got a distant memory of those broadcasts in the earlier days of the event. The SCP Foundation. I noted down coordinates to the nearest facility they had on the books. And if I'm honest, Nearest is only a relative term, because at this rate, it's gonna take me an eternity to get there. But it'll be worth it in the end when I get there. It'll all be worth it if I can at least get some answers, at least know why the world turned into this hell. Those SCP folks seem better prepared for this than anyone, so even if they can't fix this, they've at least got to have answers, right? Somebody needs to have answers. I really want to believe that. When the sun goes down, I'll start moving again. If you're watching this, wish me luck. I don't have much food left. I'll do what I can. Yeah, hey, I realize I'm not looking great right now, but trust me, you should see the other guy. Day 65 to day 86. Never thought I would make it this far, but hey, life's just full of surprises. Before you ask, and I mean, why would you ask? It's not like I can hear you. It wasn't one of the monsters that did this to me. It was another person just like me. Desperate, hungry, afraid. The one difference between me and them was the fact that they had a handgun and I didn't. They asked for all the food I had and when I wasn't exactly forthcoming, they decided to shoot me and steal the last of my food while I lay bleeding on the ground. Oh, well, okay, that's not entirely fair. They did leave me with one protein bar, which I had to cave and eat a couple days ago. Since then, I've just been foraging what little food I can from plants along the way during my nighttime walks. But it isn't much, and my wound is giving me grief. I sure hope they've got doctors at this SCP Foundation, or otherwise... Ow. I may be even more out of luck than I thought. Here's the good news for you, since I know how much you love that. I'm not far off of the foundation site now. Even in this state, I'm probably only a couple weeks away. I think maybe I can will myself to live that long, at least. If I can get some answers just <laughs> before I die, then I can be happy. And sometimes, folks, that's all you can ask for. <sighs> Final stretch. Let's hope I see you again on the other end. Stay safe. I'm here. I'm here. The SCP Foundation on day 100. But I don't understand. Where is everybody? Hello? Is anybody there? God damn it. Why is nobody here? I, I don't understand. They were meant to have the answers. They were meant to know what was going on here, but they're all gone too. It isn't fair. It isn't fair. Is this it? Is it all just over? The end of the freaking world as we know it? It isn't fair. It isn't fair. It isn't fair. Wait, are those footsteps? Hello? Yes! Hello! I'm over here! Who's there? Oh my god, what the hell is that thing? No! No, get away from me! Oh god! Disgusting. Dr. Jack Bright was having the second worst day of his life, and things weren't about to get any better. He ran down the main hall of Site-19, medallion jangling against his chest. 
All around him, sirens blared and warning lights flashed a stark, threatening red. He cursed and muttered under his breath. Just an hour ago, things had been under control. Neat and orderly, standard running operations. And now they were staring down the barrel of both a broken masquerade scenario and a potential XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. And on a more personal level, four of the meanest, nastiest, and deadliest anomalies were on his tail. They breached containment, compromised site security, and now they were out for revenge. What was happening? How had this group of anomalies gotten out? And why were they all after Dr. Bright? And most importantly of all, how could everything have gone to hell in a handbasket so fast? Let's rewind the clock and see. The morning had begun in the break room. Dr. Bright was enjoying a nice cup of hot coffee and a Danish watching the news. It was, by all accounts, an incredibly boring day. The reports were economic figures, a few dry statistics about unemployment, and then live coverage of a presidential press conference on the White House lawn. Dr. Bright was halfway through a thought about how he'd hated his brief period of time inhabiting the body of George W. Bush and running the country when the president started melting over his podium on live TV, as well as his guards, and the press corps, and the camera people. It was a sight so shocking it made Dr. Bright drop his coffee cup and almost drop his Danish. He slipped out his phone and fired off a text to 05-1, the leader of the 05 Council, simply saying, We may have a problem. To which he received the quick and emphatic reply, "Ya think? Dr. Bright started frantically changing the channel. He wanted to know if some anomalous troublemaker had just melted the president and those around him, perhaps to destabilize the US government. That'd be a textbook chaos insurgency move, or if they were looking at something considerably more dangerous. And considering every single channel Dr. Bright changed to started displaying a signal interrupted message, now was probably not the time to be optimistic. It was here, the big one, the one they'd all been waiting for. Battle stations, engage. Across Site-19, the protocols were enacted to put everything on total lockdown. Nobody in, nobody out. It was lucky for everyone inside that hadn't already been exposed that this protocol also involved the automatic shuttering of every single window in the building. Dr. Bright and a crack team of senior researchers and administrators gathered in the site's command center and opened up a live video link to 05-1. They might make some sense of all this chaos now and figure out a good battle plan. So, what's the situation, boss? Dr. Bright asked. 05-1 let out a deep, rattling sigh. Well, Jack, things are about as bad as they'd ever been, so I'll try my best to take inventory. A quarter of the council is gone. They got exposed and stopped reporting in during the initial shift. That includes 05-9 on the orbiting base, given she probably got the most direct exposure. A senior administrator raised their hand and asked, Exposure to what, sir? 05-1 took a grave pause before saying, Sunlight. That seems to be what we're up against here. The one common denominator that seems to connect everyone experiencing these anomalous effects is direct sunlight exposure. It causes people to take on a kind of gelatinous state. And it isn't just people either, it's all living anomalies too. Something about this new sun thing, it's almost like it cancels out all previous anomalous effects. The only anomalies that seem to be exempt are the ones who aren't even made out of flesh. Dr. Bright, who had a tendency to make jokes as an emotional defense mechanism when things got tough, chimed in with, On a semi-related note, anyone here feel like taking the lizard for a walk? The few nervous chuckles in the room were cut off by 05-1 slamming his fist against the table over the video link. Everyone fell into a deathly silence. Damn it, Jack, this is no laughing matter. The Foundation and the rest of the human race is decimated right now. We're looking at billions dead already, or at least changed. And even our people, a good portion of them, are reading the tea leaves and abandoning their posts to spend what could be their last hours with their families. It is imperative we take control of this situation right now. It may be our last chance. So get your asses in gear and make it happen. And with that, the video link was cut off. And the ragtag leaders of Site-19 got to work. Taking what they knew about this lethal new scenario, 
Dr. Bright had his subordinates record and release one of the most significant videos of the 21st century, or perhaps even all of time, to be broadcasted on every communication channel the Foundation could possibly hijack. TV, radio, social media, YouTube, Twitch, all global news outlets. The SCP Foundation was going public. People all over the world, huddled in the dark, terrified of the horrors they'd seen through windows or out of the safety of shady corners, noticed that all the screens around them started playing the same thing in perfect synchronicity. It was flashing red with an unfamiliar logo, while a commanding voice droned on with the only instructions that might give them hope for survival. This is a public service announcement from the SCP Foundation. We are commandeering all broadcast channels and frequencies to deliver a vital message. Avoid sunlight at all costs, cover your bodies thoroughly, and follow the instructions on the screen to reach the nearest operational SCP Foundation containment site. Back at Site-19, Dr. Bright and everyone they had left were preparing for a sudden influx of refugees from the outside. Any members of D-Class personnel who weren't psychopathic killers were deputized as honorary Foundation personnel and brought in to convert empty wings into sleeping and living areas. Bright, who was still trying to hold on to some semblance of humor in this dark time, thought to himself, well, if I knew we were going to be entertaining guests, I would have cleaned up the place a little more. You know, maybe bought some new throw pillows and a scented candle or two. And make no mistake, it was indeed an incredibly dark time. It had only been a few hours since the phenomenon started, and already it was hell out there. Society had already effectively collapsed during the chaos. The streets were filled with the shambling remains of melted nightmare people. The sun shone far above like some all-powerful tyrant, gazing its single deadly eye down on all of humanity. For billions upon billions of years it had given this solar system life. Now, all it had for them was death and destruction. For those trapped outside, there was only one hope of survival, getting to one of these SCP Foundation containment sites. At least those people somehow knew what was going on here. Little did these unfortunate refugees of a horribly and irreparably changed world know that all was not well in the world of the SCP Foundation. As the hours marched on, broken masquerade scenario and possible XK aside, it seemed to Dr. Bright that they actually had a handle on the situation, all things considered. And what's more, the night was about to fall, allowing for free movement outside. This would be a boon for people hoping to reach Site-19 with minimal risk of exposure. But refugees wouldn't be the only thing coming to Site-19 that day. Hours earlier and miles away, something terrible happened at Containment Area 25B, an extensive and heavily guarded containment site with only one inmate. During the initial panic of the event that they were now codenaming When Day Breaks, many of the guards were exposed and several others abandoned their posts in panic, knowing that the world as they had all grown to know it had come to an end. This left the place grievously underguarded. 200 meters under the sea, in the true heart of the containment area, an obsidian coffin was surrounded by a confused and terrified skeleton crew. And the term skeleton crew was about to take on a far more literal meaning, as the obsidian coffin they were trying in vain to keep contained started to rattle. Fast forward by 20 minutes and every single member of Foundation personnel at Containment Area 25B was dead, and SCP-076-2, the legendary immortal warrior Abel, was standing in the ruins of the base. While it would be easy to write Abel off as a mindless killing machine because of the sheer ferocity he brings to a battle, the reality couldn't be further from the case. He had the kind of tactical intelligence that human supercomputers wouldn't develop for another several centuries if the world hadn't ended already. From the visual evidence he'd gleaned upon escaping, he already knew that sunlight had turned deadly turning everyone who was exposed into these feeble blobs. So if he hoped to continue his killing frenzy elsewhere, he'd need to create his own shade during transit. That would be simple enough. With a cruel smirk, Abel picked up one of the reinforced blast doors he'd so easily burst through earlier. The sheer weight of it would have crushed a mortal man, but for Abel, this was little more than a light workout. He lifted the door above his head like a parasol, 
bathing himself in the cool shade before taking off at impossible speeds. He'd remembered a lot from his days under the Foundation's employ as part of the disastrous Pandora's Box Mobile Task Force, and one of those things was the location of Site-19. There'd be plenty of warriors for him to send to their makers there. Back at Site-19, where Abel would very shortly arrive, Dr. Bright and his team were helping the first wave of outsiders into the confines of the building. At first, it had seemed like a good idea, something they could sustain. But now, Dr. Bright was starting to worry about all the practical considerations. How would they keep potentially thousands or even tens of thousands of people fed, clothed, and watered for an extended period of time? Sure, they had the infinite pizza box, but pizza for three meals a day for weeks on end was a fast track to everyone here dying of scurvy. These new worries were interrupted by a siren that signaled familiar ones. There had been a containment breach in several cells in the humanoid containment wings. Some of the low-risk or even friendly humanoids, like SCP-343, aka God, had been let out to assist in gathering survivors from the nighttime chaos outside. That meant anyone still locked up really, really, really needed to stay locked up. In other words, it was very bad news. Dr. Bright cursed under his breath and instructed his subordinates to keep focusing on the refugee situation. He shouldered an assault rifle and took off into the bowels of the site, hoping he could at least head off the escapees until some guards or mobile task forces from smaller sites could reach Site-19 and help him in getting them fully recontained. Oh, this is just typical, he thought to himself. When it rains, it pours. We can never catch a break around here, can we? I should have followed my dreams and become a competitive ice dancer, then I never would have. Dr. Bride's self-pity was interrupted by a brutal punch to the side of his head, which laid him out against the wall. He turned, vision swimming, and raised his assault rifle, hoping to find a target in the blur. That's when an obsidian blade swung at impossible speed and cleaved his gun in half. He could feel his breath hitch in his throat as his vision recentered itself, and he saw the imposing tattooed figure of Abel standing above him, wielding one of his trademark swords. His dark eyes were burning with deadly intent. Hello, Jack, he said. Long time no see. I imagine I don't need to remind you who I am. Abel laughed, and Dr. Bright felt his muscles tense in rage. Of course he knew Abel. Not only had the homicidal maniac been a consistent thorn in the Foundation's side since day one, but he'd also been the one to change Dr. Bright's life forever. It had been Abel who had killed him as a junior researcher when he was first carrying the SCP-963 medallion. It was Abel who had cursed him with this terrible immortality. Dr. Bright despised him to his core. I'd like you to meet a few friends I made since I got here, Jack. Abel said, gesturing into the darkness of the hallway. Who said I was bad at teamwork? It was like something out of a nightmare. First, SCP-106 stepped forward, dripping with that terrible black tar. His face twisted into a manic grin that foretold inhuman tortures to come. Then came SCP-953, the devilish polymorphic humanoid, claws and fangs bared, tails swaying, and then, bafflingly, SCP-2430, the immortal Hitler clone. Dr. Bright tried to move, but found the tip of Abel's sword right in front of his face. It's funny, Jack, Abel said. You are an anomaly who kills to live. How many people have worn your little necklace, and yet you can swan around as you please while we rot away in containment? We think it's time for a little payback. Bright nodded. That makes sense, I guess, but why is he here? He pointed to the immortal Hitler clone, who sneered as usual. He thinks you're Jewish, said the polymorphic humanoid in Korean. Clearly, that wasn't Korean, but here we are. Dr. Bright rose uneasily to his feet, honestly surprised that Abel was allowing him to do so. He was lucky, in a sense. It perhaps took a being as strong as Abel to hold these others at bay. As much as Dr. Bright despised the man, he offered a much quicker and more painless death than the old man or the polymorphic humanoid. It wouldn't be anything he hadn't experienced before, after all. Life could be a sick joke sometimes. So, what's the plan? You're gonna kill me again? Dr. Bright asked. The four nightmarish anomalies all began to laugh. <laughs> well, in the end, yes, Abel said. But the world's gone to hell. You people aren't in control here anymore, so we can take our time. 
We will slaughter you and everyone else in here. If I were you, I'd run, Jack. He didn't need to be told twice. Jack ran for his life, too scared to even look behind him as the sound of footsteps got louder. The only way things could possibly get worse is if he somehow, amidst all this, suddenly developed a hernia. And the way this day was going, he really wouldn't have been surprised. Dr. Bright turned a corner and somehow the polymorphic humanoid was already there, standing in front of him. She gave a girlish giggle and swiped at him, leaving four ragged claw marks on his chest. Dr. Bright winced in pain and started running in the other direction. He reached an adjoining hallway and booked it for the armory, hoping there he'd get some serious firepower. But as CP-106 suddenly phased through the wall next to him, grabbing Dr. Bright by his lab coat and throwing him against the opposite wall with a flick of his wrist. Bright scrambled to discard the coat, already being eaten away by the old man's caustic fluids. The old man was just watching him and chuckled faintly, amused by the whole affair. These damn anomalies were in control now. Dr. Bright got up and kept running. The one saving grace was the fact that all of these anomalies were too sadistic to outright kill him just yet so he still had the faintest of chances. He ran into the break room, tipping over shelves, bookcases, and furniture to obstruct the path behind him ever so slightly. That's when he heard the door behind him open, followed by a wave of furious German expletives as the immortal Hitler clone entered the room to give chase. However, moments later, Hitler fell to the ground, clutching his foot and wailing in agony. You see, due to the circumstances of his creation, Joseph Stalin, Sarkic Wizards, it was a whole thing, we really can't get into it now. He felt pain at three times the intensity of a normal human being. Lieber Gott, I've stopped my toe! He yelled. Dr. Bright kept running. From the break room, he entered the hallway that would lead him back to the main barracks. Perhaps there he could get some reinforcements. And maybe he could. His thoughts were once again cut off by Abel suddenly appearing and grabbing him by the throat. His grip was impossibly strong. Dr. Bright was already seeing stars. Think you could get away that easily? Abel hissed. With horrifying strength, Abel slammed Dr. Bright up against one of the shuttered windows. He struck it with such a force he broke through the shutter and the glass behind it, sailing down to the ground outside. They were lucky it was nighttime, or this all would have been over already. Abel soon followed him down, cracking his knuckles and assuming a fighting stance. Up on your feet, Jack, Abel said. I won't kill a man lying down. No honor in that. Jack rose, feeling pain in every inch of his body. Up against a seven-foot-tall jacked monster of a man with thousands of years of fighting under his belt, he stood mathematically zero chance. But perhaps he could at least get some licks in. He ran at Abel, screaming with years of pent-up rage, and tried to attack him with a flurry of blows. But not a single one landed. Abel was able to dodge every punch and returned them with a force comparable to being hit by a runaway train. He knocked Dr. Bright to the ground and started beating him relentlessly. All these lives I've given you, all this extra time and still, you haven't learned how to fight. Pathetic, Abel roared, punctuating his words with blows. Perhaps in a thousand years you might last sixty seconds against me. You are a waste of your gift. Dr. Bright could already feel the life leaving his body when something new entered the equation. He could barely make it out through his bloody, swollen eyes, but something huge was coming towards them. It was like flesh from so many of the melted people had coagulated into some huge mountainous blob. It was a sight so remarkable and horrifying that even Abel was distracted, and Dr. Bright took advantage of the one chance that it gave him. He took off his medallion and threw it at the mass. The life left his old body as SCP-963 deleted the collection of tortured minds that had made up the terrible flesh monster and replaced them with only one, Dr. Jack Bright. He felt new, immense, monstrous strength well up through him. He was in the body of a true abomination, and all of its power was his now. How about a round two, Abel? He thought. The ancient warrior produced a pair of ebony swords as Dr. Bright sent a swarm of fleshy tendrils at him. Abel was quick, slicing off many of them, but there was only so much he could take. Soon, Dr. Bright's new body was grabbing Abel's every appendage, holding him in place as he struggled with all his anomalous might. But now, Dr. Bright's rage had meaning. With his new power to back it up, he'd get a little revenge at long last. Time to go back in the box, Abel. It took longer than it would for any mortal man, but eventually, it happened all the same. Bright pushed and pulled in every direction, applying every kind of pressure, leveraging every ounce of his terrible new mass onto Abel's body until... Crunch. 
Dr. Bright relaxed his new body in a final cathartic relief, dropping Abel's corpse to the ground. There was no denying after everything that happened that it felt really, really, really good. The world may have ended, but at least Dr. Bright got one win today. Shirley woke up screaming, louder than usual this time. Bay, Shirley's wife, bolted upright, as though someone had just run a 20,000 volt charge through her. Her dirty hand clasped over Shirley's mouth until the awful sound stopped. She whispered, Baby, it was just a dream. Just a dream. Shirley fell into a terrified silence, trying to regulate her breathing. They'd been hiding in an abandoned apartment block for three days now, waiting for the roads to clear so they could take the chance and move forward. Bay, keeping closer to the ground, scuttled over to one of the smashed out windows. She stared down onto the street, 30 feet below. Midnight. No stars, cars crashed up against one another from the initial panic, and thank God, none of those things down there. She breathed a sigh of relief and returned to Shirley, gathering her up in her arms and giving her a reassuring squeeze. Her body was still trembling. What happened in this one? Bea asked. Shirley exhaled and closed her eyes. We were close now, she said. We're so close, Bay. It was the dream that began this journey. The quest for the last safe place. Initially, Bay had thought it was a fool's errand. There were no safe places in this world anymore. Nowhere that the sun or its terrible monsters hadn't touched. But Shirley insisted otherwise. She'd seen it in her dreams. A place of almost mythical wonder. A vast and complex facility away from the light. Site 19. Shirley and Bay grabbed their backpacks and shrugged them on. It was best to set off now, get a few hours of walking under their belts, and find some shelter before the sun came back up. In the meantime, all they needed to do was avoid the monsters lurking out there. It was an interesting trade-off. Once upon a time, years and years ago, when the sun changed, there had been billions of those things. They were people once, until the new light touched them and turned them into these slimy abominations. There was a time you couldn't look out your window without seeing hundreds of them slithering past you. Then, they started coagulating, becoming these huge, mountainous masses of gloopy, melted flesh. It was nice that there were fewer now, made them easier to avoid, easier to sneak around, but if one of those things found you, you were dead. Or more likely, you were about to be something so much worse than dead. The two women trekked down the side of the road, keeping to the shadows even in the dark. They were on the edge of the city now, and it wouldn't be long until they were in the wilderness. Pro, being away from a population center meant lower odds of being attacked by one of those monsters. Con, fewer places to hide when the sun came up. In the meantime, all they could do was keep walking and hope. It was an almost supernatural mixture of luck and skill that had gotten them this far. They'd known each other for four years when day broke, and everything went to hell. But they'd only been married for about a month. It'd been a hell of a post-honeymoon wake-up call. So many had been changed in the initial panic, and so many more had been destroyed by what came after. But these two weren't just anybody. In fact, it was the specific combination of skills and knowledge these two possessed that kept them alive for this long. In the world that came before, Bay had been a soldier who'd done two tours abroad and seen active combat multiple times, and Shirley had been a doctor, rising through the ranks of a local hospital. Between them, they could fight for and heal one another, despite everything. And in those early years, that's all it had been. They were always moving, always avoiding the terrors outside and the tyranny of the sun. They'd avoided the dangers that had destroyed so many others, but they'd never dared to hope. Hope was lofty, impractical, it got people killed. They'd only ever tried to survive. The immediate avoidance of death was a practical goal. Anything else was just confetti. Until, of course, Shirley had started having the dreams. Some were just fragments, like sifting through a stack of photographs in the middle of a deep fog. Others were full narratives, like movies in her head, viewed in the first person. But all of them were about the same thing. She and Bay needed to make it to a place they called Site 19. Something about it was familiar, like a thing she'd heard years ago. 
Perhaps from those strange broadcasts that were on every TV screen during the initial chaos. Oh, and of course, there was one more element in the dream. The one thing that made it seem more like a nightmare. In this part of the dream, she was already in Site-19 and walking down a long, dark hallway somewhere far away from the sun. There are a series of heavy reinforced doors along the wall next to her. Each one of them had a number on them. Advancing as she got further down the hall, 029, 030, 031, 032. That's when she'd hear the voice. That awful, terrible voice. Shirley. Oh, Shirley. Come closer. Don't you want to see my face? I'm smiling, Shirley. I'd like for you to see it. She'd reached the door marked 035, at which point the door slowly creaked open. Even after all the terrifying things they'd seen in the new world, this somehow paralyzed her with fear every time. It was a kind of dread she'd never experienced before. Something that looked like black water would start seeping out from the opening door, then footsteps getting closer. A shambling figure would emerge from the open door. It was hard to make it out fully in the dark, but somehow she just intuitively knew what was coming towards her. It had a stark white face like a mask, with nothing but darkness where the eyes should be. Down below, the body, seemingly heavily injured and dripping with the same black water, was one she recognized. Her own. She couldn't move. The masked figure, this masked version of her, kept getting closer, dripping with more and more of that black water. It was shaking, almost vibrating. Then she realized it was laughing. <laughs> See you soon, Shirley, it said. Can't wait for you and Bay to visit. And that was when she woke up screaming. Somehow, despite the grim ending, some part of Shirley knew that she and Bay needed to get to Site-19. Only there would she be safe, and perhaps even find the answers about how all this horror had even transpired. They were already risking their lives out here every day. Wouldn't it be worth it to find the truth? The duo continued to trudge through the night. It was, they thanked their lucky stars, a relatively uneventful journey. They encountered one of the flesh beasts on the edge of town, but they were able to hide inside a nearby bus depot until it slithered on, gibbering incoherent madness. After waiting to make sure it was gone, the duo left the city and ventured out into the Badlands. Shirley continued to insist that the legendary Site-19 from her dreams was definitely close by now. Bay looked up to the sky and chimed in, I hope you're right, honey, or you and me are fried eggs. Shirley and Bay walked for another several hours, each becoming more slightly anxious that the sun would rise before they reached ample cover and everything they worked for would be taken away from them. The terror persisted until, against all odds, a huge black shape started to emerge along the horizon. The sight of it made Shirley's eyes widen in amazement. That's it, Bay, she said. Site 19, just like it was in my dreams. They passed the chain link fence around the perimeter, approaching this large, seemingly abandoned building like it was the lost city of El Dorado. Bay was astonished. She loved Shirley, of course, and had faith in her beliefs, but something about a place prophesized in a dream actually being real was honestly nothing short of a miracle. The two of them approached the fortified front door and heaved it open together. Against all odds, they could see light inside the building. They still had power here. Nowhere had power anymore. Maybe this place really was salvation after all. As the two closed the door behind them, they noticed that the windows all around them were shuttered. It must have been some precautionary measure against the new sun. Smart. Whoever these people were, they'd thought ahead. They'd have some kind of preparation for all of this. So Bay couldn't help but wonder, where had they all gone now? As the two ventured deeper into the building, Bay unholstered a handgun that she'd been keeping in her jacket. It was no good against the flesh monsters, but it was a worthwhile deterrent against other desperate people out on the road. Lucky for them, she hadn't needed to fire it yet. Other than the power being on somehow, the place seemed abandoned. They traveled from room to room, 
Offices, filing areas, what seemed like laboratories, libraries, rest areas. There was no real indication of what these people, whoever they were, actually did around here. After searching through a few different files, all written in almost incomprehensible shorthand and code, Shirley at least found a name to put to these people. The SCP Foundation. Was it some kind of charity? They ventured deeper, until they found a hall marked D-Class Bunks. Inside, they found bunk beds stacked on top of each other, enough to hold hundreds of people. Bay wondered aloud whether this was some kind of secret paramilitary outfit. It was the one thing that might explain everything they'd seen here today. And in all fairness, she was at least partially right. Okay, ladies, hold it right there. Shirley and Bay turned around to see a man in an orange jumpsuit standing a few feet behind them. He was carrying an assault rifle and training it on both of them. He was a tall, imposing man, and yet he was shaking. Bay lowered her gun. Neither she nor Shirley said a word. You're human, right? He said, voice trembling slightly. What? Shirley replied. Just answer the damn question. There was a tense pause, where nobody there seemed to know what might happen to them next. The stranger's finger started curling around the trigger. It was Bay who broke the silence. We look human, don't we? She said. Another moment passed. The gun rattled in the stranger's hands. He exhaled and lowered the barrel, taking a more relaxed stance. Sorry, he said. Can't be too careful. Kind of stuff they used to keep in here. It'd give you nightmares. Ah, uh, Mike, by the way. He approached, tentatively shaking Shirley and Bay's hands, just to prove to them that he wasn't the kind of guy who liked to gun down random women. He asked them whether they were hungry, and when they told them they hadn't eaten anything but protein bars in over a week, he told them he was about to show them something incredible. The Site-19 break room. Not long after that, Shirley, Bay, and Mike were all sitting around, enjoying some defrosted Hot Pockets. At that moment, no three-course meal cooked up by a five-star chef could ever even compare. As they ate together, Mike told his story. The people who used to run this place, believe me, they were nut jobs. Sure, back in the day, I wasn't such a nice guy. Me and some other knuckleheads, we needed the money, so we robbed a few places. People got caught in the crossfire. Next thing I know, I'm on death row. And then these men in white coats, they came and told me I could get a commuted sentence if I came and took part in some experiments. That's how they got me into the house of whores right here. If Shirley and Bay hadn't lived through the apocalyptic hell of when day breaks, they might have not believed Mike. He told them about how this SCP Foundation used to use humans in experiments, subjecting them to all the monsters they had locked up down here. There was this giant reptile that couldn't be killed, some freaky statue that'd snap your neck if you stopped looking at it. But the one that frightened him the most, the one that haunted his dreams ever since he got here. The mask, Shirley said aloud, lost in thought. Mike was taken aback. How had she known what he was going to say? It did nothing to reduce his fear when she told him that she'd been dreaming about the mask for over a month now, stark white with black water dripping from it. Everyone was silent for a moment. Bay and Mike just stared at Shirley, equal parts amazed and frightened. Mike cleared his throat and told Shirley that in the years that had passed since day broke, the population of Site-19 had slowly dwindled. Monsters had escaped. The flesh beasts had slithered in and taken others. Over time, most of the staff had either died, changed, or left. All that was left here was him and the mask. Luckily for him, he'd never been directly cross-tested with it, because those who got tested with the mask never came back. Sometimes he could hear it whispering in his dreams, trying to leak itself into his mind, drip by drip, poisoning his soul. The one saving grace was that being a mask, it couldn't exactly walk up and tap you on the shoulder. All you needed to do was stay away from it, and you'd be fine. The mask couldn't hurt you on its own. The three of them carried on talking for the last hours of the morning. Night had become day, and day had become night. It was the easiest way to survive these days, or at least survive as yourself. Bay and Shirley told Mike how they'd met in college all those years ago. Mike told them the story of how he managed to survive by hiding in a broom closet, while some gangly white monstrosity chased down and slaughtered the rest of his bunkmates. The tiredness took them all again, and they decided to bed down in the D-class bunks. They were more comfortable than the bedrolls that Shirley and Bay had been sleeping on in abandoned buildings for the last year or so. 
To Mike, this place had been a living hell once upon a time. But now, for a brief period in this terrifying new world, it could be heaven. Shirley drifted off to uneasy sleep, trying her best to ignore the whispers. In what only felt like a few moments, her eyes fluttered back open. She was in a new place, but one that felt oddly familiar. A long, dark hallway bordered on one side by a series of iron doors. She turned her head slightly, eyes still adjusting to the darkness. The number on the door next to her read 027. Further down the hall, Shirley saw a dark figure, standing tall, shoulders broad, and back erect as a ballet dancer. As her vision came back into focus, she saw a shock of orange. It was Mike, wearing that same orange jumpsuit. He was standing about 10 or 15 feet away, staring in the opposite direction. Mike, Shirley said, operating on the foggy half-logic of a dream. He didn't respond. With growing concern, she started stepping closer. Mike? That's when she noticed something else. Black water pooled around Mike's feet. The sight of it stopped her in her tracks and froze the breath in her throat. With an almost audible creak, Mike turned around. A grinning white mask covered up his face. Hello, Shirley, it said. So lovely to finally meet face to face, eh? I bet you're so glad you ran into me. After all, Sleepwalking can be dangerous. Shirley screamed and ran in the opposite direction, wasting no time at all. She heard the slow, measured footsteps of Mike wearing the mask behind her. It was in no rush. It walked like a masked killer in a horror movie. Why run? The voice said. I've got all day, and I know you can't leave while the sun's up, darling. You and your beloved are all mine. It's only a matter of time. Somehow, despite her being so far ahead, the voice sounded like it was right next to her ear. Like it wasn't speaking out of its mouth. It was just talking directly into her brain. With every syllable, her mind started to slow. Like the mask's voice was tar seeping in between the gears. Soon enough, her legs stopped working. Shirley was frozen in place hearing the footsteps of the masked Mike behind her. Her brain was flooded with dark thoughts. Death, pain, torture, grief. The final smothering of all hopes and happiness. There was really nothing like it. Like every nightmare she'd ever experienced being collected into one terrible elixir and poured onto her mind. So this was what that horrible mask could do. Soon enough, the masked Mike had passed her and turned to look directly at her face. There was an awful smell like chemicals and burning flesh. She turned her gaze downwards, seeing that it looked like Mike's body was somehow melting away from all that black water. It was like acid. Mike was a weak host, the mask said, as if it was replying to her thoughts. He won't last much longer, but that's fine. I'm looking forward to taking you for a whirl, dear Shirley. And when your hands are mine, you can only imagine the terrible things I'm going to do to your beloved bay with them. Shirley, with all her willpower, was able to move her mouth enough to force out the words, Don't you dare touch her. The monster laughed, just like it always did in her dream. <laughs> That's not your choice to make anymore, it said. The mast reached for her with Mike's melting fingers, fizzling away with all that black slime, getting so close to caressing her tender cheek. All that awful silence was only broken by the sound of a soft clicking behind it, then a gunshot passing through the back of its stolen head. The mast turned, more shocked than anything, to see Bay standing there, wielding Mike's old assault rifle and aiming it with deadly accuracy. Before the mask could breathe another poisonous word, Bay opened fire, releasing a volley of bullets into the last of its melting body as it staggered back into the darkened hallway. Shirley watched in astonishment as the creature fell, Mike's body splattering into a puddle and sending the mask itself skiddling down the hallway. Maybe it was just a trick of the mind, but she could swear the mask was frowning now, not smiling. Bay breathed a sigh of relief and said, I'm thinking it's probably better if this place stays abandoned. Shirley, who hadn't quite regained her speech just yet, just smiled, nodded, and embraced Bay. 
They shared a kiss, just happy to still be together and alive, despite it all. Come nightfall, they left again, in search of another place. The possessive mask remained there, laying on the floor of some anonymous Site-19 hallway, just waiting for some unlucky, weak-minded survivor to wander in and try it on. While some higher-level researchers, specialized guards, and containment experts at the SCP Foundation have fixed anomalous projects tailored to their very particular set of skills, for many lower-level operatives, including junior researchers, guards, janitorial staff, and even the dreaded D-classes, every day is showing up, spinning the wheel of misfortune, and finding out how you might die today. Will you be hacked to pieces by a murder monster, pulled into a portal, turned into a doll, eaten alive, made into a living nest by bugs, stretched out and broken, drowned, exsanguinated, set on fire, beaten to death by a volley of anomalous tomatoes because you decided to drop a cringeworthy dad joke or a rancid pun? There are perhaps only a handful of anomalies that not only will not harm you, but will actively enrich your life by getting to spend time with them. And of course, chief among these is the legendary SCP-999, also known by its adorable moniker, the Tickle Monster. We don't need to get into too much detail in describing this gelatinous ray of sunshine. His anomalous delightfulness has made him somewhat of a celebrity compared to the murderer's row of terrifying entities and monsters around him. The researcher assigned to him today was troubled, having seen one of his favorite co-workers devoured by SCP-682 the day before. Getting assigned to feeding and checking on SCP-999 today was exactly what he needed. As he entered the room, several bags of M&Ms in hand, the creature cooed, perhaps sensing his tension, and approached him. Immediately, the researcher felt a wave of calm and contentment wash over him, the incredible and rare feeling that perhaps everything is going to be alright for once. 999 rubbed up against his leg as he poured M&Ms into its eager mouth, radiating good vibes the whole time. What an asset. What a gift. And to think this adorable little goober was prophesized to someday save the world. That much seemed almost funny, but he was certainly more than capable of saving the life of someone who hadn't felt the warmth of internal sunshine in quite some time. And for that much, the researcher was profoundly grateful. He left 999's chamber that day with a renewed sense of hope for the future, that maybe, just maybe, they might be able to pull through, to make a difference, to push this crazy ball of rock we call our home in the right direction. Maybe someday, the sun would rise on a perfect world. Who would have thought that a strange sunrise could change everything? Emergency sirens went off across the globe, but in every case, they were drowned out by a terrible, endless chorus of screams. But below all that, you'll hear another gut-wrenching sound, a low but pervasive sizzling like an egg on a hot pan, as billions of human beings started to change their states of matter. The SCP Foundation had fought off and contained so many seemingly impossible threats, from interdimensional horrors like the Hanged, Sealed, and Scarlet Kings, to nightmarish mass killers like SCP-106, The Old Man, SCP-096, The Shy Guy, and SCP-682, The Hard-to-Destroy Reptile. In their many battles against the Anomalous, they developed the incredible methodologies and exceedingly advanced technology. But what good would any of it do when the very center of our solar system decided in an instant that rather being the linchpin of our delicate cradle of life, it would instead be the horrible instrument of all of our demises. This awful hypothetical was answered upon the emergence of SCP-001, a terrible day also known as when day breaks. In the snap of one's fingers, half the world was plunged into terror and death. Rays of stark red light swept through the streets. People lucky enough to be in the shade or inside buildings with a view to the outside saw the people in the streets seize up and begin to shriek in terrible pain. Their skin sagged and their bones liquefied. Their bodies dropped down to the ground and coalesced into gurgling, retching puddles the color of melted flesh. Those who saw this abomination happening would never forget it. It would stay with them for the rest of their lives. It would endure like a stain on their retinas, an afterimage burned into the plasma of an old TV screen. But here's a slight consolation. For most of the human race, the rest of their lives wouldn't be that long. 
The sudden insanity taking over the world caused the SCP Foundation to do something drastic. Step out of the shadows. Metaphorically speaking, of course. The legendary Foundation motto had been reversed. They would die in the light so that humanity could live on in the dark. Thankfully, the very concept of the day gave them one advantage. While one side of the Earth was effectively doomed the second the process began, the other side had a 12-hour head start before the sun turned its terrible eye to them. Sirens went off in the middle of the night, waking people up groggy, rubbing the sleep from their eyes. Every television and radio and internet-enabled device in their home was playing the same message, direct from the SCP Foundation which now had effectively commandeered the entire U.S. government, along with the rest of the world. It gave them directions to the nearest Foundation containment site, and told them that if they didn't immediately comply and find their way to safety, they would experience a terrible death by sunrise. And if you're at all familiar with human beings, you've probably already predicted that they didn't just calmly wrap themselves up, make their way to their cars, and form an orderly line to the various Foundation containment sites located around them. It was, in fact, total pandemonium. As the solar clock ticked down, slowly marking off the seconds that anyone outside had left to live, the only human beings with a meaningful head start began to go insane in a number of varied and interesting ways. Some who took the situation seriously and acknowledged that the sun was indeed going to wipe out most of humanity simply cracked under the pressure. There were those who went into totally catatonic states, rocking back and forth in the corner and refusing to respond to any stimuli. Some became erratic and violent, with unpredictable behavior that harmed themselves and others. After all, what was the point in acting normally anymore, when the complete crumbling of human civilization was imminent, and their only hope was some shadowy organization they'd never heard of? Some not heeding the warning seriously enough and prompted by greed and opportunism, tried to take advantage of the situation financially. Some smashed windows of local stores and looted, or broke into the homes of neighbors who had already fled in hopes of purloughing their property. Others were a little more creative, setting up short-term, everything-must-go, nighttime fire sales for their brands of essential oils, neurotropics, and nutraceuticals, claiming all of them had the power to ward off or cure the new effects of the sun. Others completely denied the possibility that any of this was real, and claimed that the messages from this so-called SCP Foundation were actually just a front to take away their freedoms and trap them in underground government camps. They staunchly refused to follow any of the safety guidelines that the SCP Foundation put out, claiming, If you try to take away my First Amendment rights, you're gonna take away my Second Amendment rights! while riding around in their pickup trucks and SUVs blasting Kid Rocks, Don't Tell Me How to Live at ear-splitting volumes. Naturally, they had all melted into screeching puddles of liquid flesh by sunrise. Some were not victims of their own bizarre choices, but were doomed by the sudden terrible fear and panic of the circumstances themselves. The highways were gridlocked, cars stuck as far as the eye could see. So many had rushed to escape during the initial wave that means of transport soon became choke points like clogged arteries in a dying man. People do irrational things when they're scared. Riots broke out in the streets. Fighting, killing, burning. Everyone hoping for some means of meager control over a situation that had long been out of any of their hands. Some were too far away with not enough time to close the distance. What could they really do but just sit around and wait to die? The hours marched on as the Earth made its slow turn towards the sun leaving one decimated half in darkness, and the other a sitting duck for its terrible effects. Hundreds of thousands had made their way to the containment sites and safely gotten inside, but still so many millions were left outside. It was a slaughterhouse, one great big global meat grinder, and every moment that passed, the handle turned, and any humans left outside got just that little bit closer to the grinding, gnashing gears below. Site-19 being the largest containment site on the Foundation books also became humanity's only bastion. It was the great hope of escape from the horrors going on outside. The Foundation had figured out so many ways of counteracting deadly anomalous forces before. Given enough time and enough personnel, surely they could figure out a solution to even this. This was, however, when the most startling realization yet swept over all the survivors. Those who were melted by the sudden hostile sun weren't dead. They were very much alive, in fact, but they'd been changed in both body and mind. 
What had once been humans now became terrible beasts. Half-melted gelatinous nightmares that coagulated into even bigger beasts. They got into their head that they were grateful for the transformation. That they had been liberated from their old forms in the old world. They were something so much more now. And they wanted everyone else to join them in their liberation. Survivors outside the Foundation containment sites were systematically hunted by these great masses of altered flesh. Even those smart enough to cover every inch of their bodies with clothes to protect from the sun, to only move at night, to carry weapons, were dragged out by meaty tendrils from their refuge in the basements and the lightless hearts of buildings, dragged into the searing gaze of the sun, to melt, to change, to coalesce into something greater. It was the inevitable fate of all of humanity. When most of the stragglers were dragged out and changed, the flesh masses started turning their attention to the Foundation containment sites that were keeping all these poor, deluded people from salvation. They mounted offensives against the bases, which the Foundation, with what remained of their manpower and advanced weaponry, did what they could to repel the attacks. But every single day, it got harder. Thankfully for the people holed up at Site-19, there was one consolation out there to help. SCP-999. The Foundation was at war with the Sun and its terrible disciples. And contrary to many people's beliefs, it takes more than men, equipment, and bullets to win a war. 999 provided the essential element that brought it all together. Morale, hope, the will to go on, even when it seemed like all could be lost. After a long day of battling the fleshy abominations at the gates, Foundation guards, mobile task force members, and even civilian volunteers were drained and traumatized by the horrors that they'd seen. Once a day was over, 999 would move among the ranks, cuddling up to them, warding off the despair that was easy to set in during the downswing of a terrible apocalypse like this. Without his presence, there would be no hope of fighting that good fight. So many of them would have given up, walked into the sun, and joined the monstrous force they were fighting. After all, they seemed happy enough and it would certainly be easier. 999 had become, once again, an indispensable asset to the SCP Foundation. The Solar Betrayal may not have been the Scarlet King's doing, well, as far as our current intel suggests anyway, but he was playing a crucial part in saving the world, exactly as predicted. 999 didn't fully understand what was going on outside sometimes, why there seemed to be fewer people as the weeks went on, and why the people there seemed so sad all the time whenever he wasn't helping them, but he was more than happy to help, whatever the case. Many of the humanoid and some even non-humanoid anomalies, which realistically posed no harm to people inside the site, were released from their containment chambers. They needed everyone and everything they could get in what seemed like a hopelessly one-sided fight against the very concept of being outside. Many of the larger, vacated chambers were now filled with refugees from the outside, many of whom had lost everything and everyone they'd ever known to the horrors out there. 999 made the rounds in these areas regularly, and through the D-Class cots, which had been repurposed into more sleeping areas for the thousands of desperate and terrified refugees. The adjustment to this new life and to the knowledge of all secrets that had been kept from them for all these years wasn't exactly easy on their psyches. But spending time with that soft yellow blob that seemed to smell exactly like their favorite scent from the old world made everything better. He was a savior in dark times, slithering from person to person, giving hope where there was none. People opened up about their problems and their fears, which these days were remarkably similar. And though 999 couldn't reply, for many it was enough just to feel like they were being listened to. He was a soft, blobby shoulder to cry on. And after day broke, everyone needed a good, old-fashioned cry. However, one day while wandering the long, dark corridors of Site-19, he saw a different kind of crying. It was a woman with an unfamiliar face, probably one of the rare new refugees bawling her eyes out to a Foundation senior researcher and an accompanying guard with an assault rifle. Hot, fat tears were rolling down her dirty cheeks, her shaking hands clasped in prayer. She was begging the researcher and the guard to let her go outside. She said that her son was still out there, hiding away in the back room of a bank where she used to work. They got separated. She needed to go back and find him. Sadly, the researcher and the guard told her that this was out of the question. Official orders stated that anyone outside the base at this time was to be considered lost. Letting her go out there to find her son would essentially be condemning her to death. 
no human could go out there safely. But of course, SCP-999 isn't, by any definition, a human. When night fell and everyone else was hunkered down inside, 999 found a small crack in the wall and slithered out of it. It may not have been communicative in the way most humans were, but 999 was indeed an intelligent being, and knew intuitively that if it left through a more obvious route, its human caretakers here at the SCP Foundation might try to stop it. And when it came to saving this little boy, 999 refused to let anyone stop it. 999 slithered out and through the broken streets. There were no bodies, of course. It seemed even the dead could be revived and assimilated through the power of the sun. Talk about a mixed miracle. But the broken down world outside Site-19 undeniably reflected the pandemonium that took place here. 999 would need to do his best to find the little boy trapped out here before the sun rose. He lost a few hours even finding his way to the nearest town, where it was safe to assume that the little boy was trapped. He saw those… things on the way there. Those moving, wailing mountains of melted human flesh, each talking and chattering to themselves in a hundred different dead voices. 999 had been cross-tested with SCP-682, and still those monsters frightened him. He decided it would be best to stay away from them and make sure that they never saw him out of here. Eventually, 999 reached the town. Similarly dilapidated and broken down in the months since the world as we had all known it disappeared in a ray of terrible sunshine. More great, gibbering blobs of flesh patrolled the streets, looking for converts to integrate into their biomass. 999 could only hope it wasn't already too late for the little boy. 999 discreetly slithered from building to building until it could identify one as this bank that the boy's distraught mother had been mentioning. It thankfully had some awareness of what a bank actually was, from the years of stressed Foundation employees telling it about the money troubles they were suffering outside of work. It was another great example of it paying to listen. Eventually, it did slither into the correct building, and it heard the extremely quiet whimpering of the boy inside. It could feel the sadness and the fear radiating off of him as it was the creature's natural instinct to help the needy, and it used those signals like a homing beam to find the scared little boy. He'd hidden inside a broom closet and was quietly weeping into his hands. He hadn't eaten in days and was only surviving by drinking the filthy water from the mop bucket sitting next to him. 999 immediately embraced the boy, covering him in its healing energy until the tears of the boy's face eventually dried. 999 cooed and chirped pleasantly until the little boy was laughing again. But this momentary joy was soon interrupted. A great heaving weight dragged itself down the hall outside. Both 999 and the boy could sense its monstrous presence. As it got closer, they could hear all those chattering voices, those poisonous whispers. When it passed the door, they heard it speaking, its voice practically vibrating with the hum of malicious lunacy. Turn, pretty flowers. Turn towards the sun. Feel it on your face. Feel yourself change and sluice and mix into us. Become one with our army of one. It must be so lonely to be you, little flower. Walk into the sun and be us. 999 and the boy remained silent in the broom closet for hours as the great shape patrolled the bank outside, searching for converts, for victims. At times, it seemed too frightening to even breathe, fearing that would be enough to make the monster detect them. It felt like an eternity until the monster eventually did slope off and leave them in the comforting quiet and darkness of the closet. Now they might be free. 999 could escort the boy safely back to the containment site and into the arms of his terrified mother. But when they opened the door, they saw a terrible sight. Light in the distance pouring through the windows and the glass double doors. It wouldn't be safe to go out that way. Upon seeing this and putting together what it meant, the boy began to cry. He couldn't take another night in the closet. It was all going to wither from here. Until 999 had a wonderful idea. Hours later, when the Foundation's guards manned the turrets at the entrance of Site-19, waiting for the inevitable onslaught of the melted flesh creatures, they tensed up, seeing a blobbing gelatinous form slithering towards them in the distance. The guards, who'd learned the hard way from too many lost men that it was better to be safe than sorry, drew a bead on the distant shape and prepared to fire, when suddenly their superior raised a hand and said, Wait! Hold fire! 
I is that 999? And it was. They all stared in astonishment as 999, chipper than ever, came towards them through the sun. It looked as though the opacity of its yellow cytoplasm had increased, but other than that, it was unaffected. Turns out the sun couldn't melt what was already melted. The guards parted to allow 999 safe passage into the facility, watching in amazement, and once it was inside, 999's slime parted, releasing its contents. One very relieved little boy. It seemed through turning up its own opacity, 999 had given the boy safe passage through the sun and back into the facility. The boy was saved. It had won. Not long after that, there was a tearful reunion between mother and child, and a brief flash of hope in this dark and terrible time. 999 didn't stop to bask, of course. It returned to its duties, keeping up staff morale and helping the refugees heal from the horrors they'd seen. In its own little way, and for a lot of people, SCP-999 really was saving the world. Or what was left of it, anyway. Oh, and of course, if SCP-999 had won your hearts just like it won ours, you'd be pleased to know that you can purchase your own adorable, high-quality SCP-999 plushie at scpswag.com. Check the link in the description to get your own. Trust us, having a 999 to cuddle really does make any apocalypse a whole lot easier. Now go check out SCP-001 when day breaks, and SCP-999 Tickle Monster vs. The Most Evil SCPs for more of the two incredibly contrasting anomalies from today's episode.